cut this shit.
Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, another year, here we are, um, Women in Engineering 2021. Thank you so much for joining us. We're super excited about the phenomenal lineup of speakers that we've got coming up shortly for you. Uh, we're here one till five today. Um, so sit tight, there's gonna be breaks, so um, you will be able to stretch your legs and get a drink. So, Introducing me, I'm Amanda Thompson. I'm the founder and MD of Campus Media. We're a youth marketing company, and we work with employers to help them reach students and graduates across secondary school, higher education, in more engaging ways. Uh, we're used to being on campus, uh, clues in the name. Um, sadly, we are not yet. We really hope we are soon, but we're pleased that you guys are going back to campus and that your lectures are starting to resume as normally. Uh, we know it's been a bit of a tough slog. We've got a poll going on in the chat. I'm not sure if you've seen it, um, but please do take part in the poll. Um, tell us where you are. Are you on campus? Are you in halls? Have you been to a lecture yet? It's all super exciting and we'd love to hear it. Um, so, COVID, uh, in a way, has completely transformed our events. Normally, we'd be in the Turing Lecture Theatre where we are today. Love this lecture theatre, love the seats, everything about it. And it would be filled with you. Um, sadly, the capacity in this lecture theatre is only 150. So, I've had a real privilege um, of not having to... Um, select people to be here in person today and actually this is making our events the most inclusive that they can be and we're also safe that you're at home in halls with your peers with your society buddies course buddies watching this together um, we would love to see your selfies and um, we've got the instagram channel they'll be putting that in the chat Today, if you want to um, send us in your selfies of you and your buddies uh, watching the event, um, also tag us in at Women uh, in Engineering, that'd be amazing to see that. And we might be able to uh, show some towards the end of the event as well. So a few reasons as to why we're here today. Um, it, it's no surprise, women are the minority. Um, in engineering uh, careers and has been for a long time. 
This is actually the, the same slide that I presented two years ago. Um, amazingly, uh, one win is we've risen a percentage um, of the number of women actually working in STEM careers. Um, but government by 2030 have set a bar that um, by then they aim to have 30% of their um, core STEM roles filled by women, which is incredible, but hopefully it's more than that. We don't yet know what impact COVID has had on the percentage of women coming into uh, STEM uh, or leaving STEM but one thing is for sure is you guys um, Gen Z are going to be coming into this fresh into your STEM careers and making a huge difference we may see the percentage drop slightly because women in um, more senior roles within engineering who have been there longer uh, parents like me um, primary caregivers like me um, may have been forced to take redundancy during COVID um, to, to look after their children. Um, I was doing a lot of homeschooling as well, so uh, it's, it's affected everybody. Um, but also it's affected people in good ways. So we're going to be seeing um, today from our speakers being yourself, that's a massive, uh, important message to get across during this event is it's important to be you. Um, we don't, an engineer doesn't come in one shape and size. Uh, they're all different. And reflecting that in who you are um, really does um, pay off as well when you're applying for your roles. Um, when you'll soon be graduating or if you've already graduated, it's really important to be yourself. There's going to be um, lots of employers here today live in the Turin Lecture Theatre with me um, and in the virtual chat room as well, answering your questions as we go through. Um, I'd like to give huge thanks to our partner, the Institution of Engineering and Technology, the IET, uh, for being our partner and joining us in this crusade to have more women in STEM roles. Um, it's vitally important. It's vitally important for organisations, for their culture, um, and it's vitally important uh, to develop a society uh, where everyone can thrive and everyone benefits rather than everything being created and designed around um, men. That said, it's really, really important to get across the message. Men are not the enemy here, and I'm super, super pleased to know that there are men watching uh, the event today. So welcome, everybody. Everybody is welcome to join. And you are an integral part of this, um, as you'll be entering, uh, hopefully as well, a STEM career when you finish your studies. You will be an ally, you'll be an important ally to many women entering who are the minority, who will need your voice to help them uh, be heard. So I'm going to move on uh, to what's coming up, obviously, on the screen behind. Event. Firstly, I would like to introduce my colleagues, um, Abby, B, and Emily, who are going to be working in the chat room. They're going to be answering your questions. B is just walking down with Mike now. Um, I don't know if you can see them all at home. They, please send your questions in to the team. They will be on hand. Anything I miss in terms of links for uh, where we want you to post your selfies to, for example, or register if you want to hear from employers, will be posted in the chat as well. So if you've got a question, please, please, please pop it in the chat. It's a really interactive event and we want to hear from you. Um, if you're struggling to chat in the chat, it's more likely because uh, you're not logged in under a Gmail or Google Mail account. So you will need to join on a Google 
email address um, to be active in the chat. So as I mentioned, also in the chat today are going to be representatives from our sponsor, WSP, and uh, GSK, Mott McDonald, BP, Capgemini and MBDA. So a big hello to those. I know they're all in the chat now, poised to answer your questions. Um, so if you've got a specific question for any one of those employers, please pop it in the, in the chat. If you've just got a general question that you, you want to get um, some general feedback on, again, pop it in the chat. If you don't want to pop your question in the chat, that's okay too. If you would like uh, one of the campus media team to ask your question, then please email it to hello at campusmedia.co.uk. And that email address is also going to be popped in the chat now as well for you. Another feature of today's event is a competition. So in celebration of Black History Month, we're going to be profiling three inspiring women who have made incredible contributions to the world through engineering. So these women are role models and will be profiled during the break. So make sure when you go off to get your cuppa or you refresh your snacks, make a note of who you see on the screen because we will have, um, you will have until 5.30 today, that's 30 minutes after the event ends, to get your answers in on the same email address uh, that I mentioned before. This amazing prize of £500 courtesy of Mott MacDonald is what you can win for your university STEM society. So when you send us your email answers after the event's finished or once you've received that third uh, engineer to note down, then please also pop the name of your society on there as well. Uh, so a few more details on the screen now as well. Um, so again, the so the sorry, the competition is going to be uh, picked at random. So there's no rush as long as you get your answers in by five thirty. Um, a winner will be picked at random and notified tomorrow. So you will be contacted um, if you have been the lucky winner and your uh, University STEM Society will win £500 courtesy of Mott MacDonald. Um, we are live. This is a live event um, and things happen when it's a live event. Um, the IET.TV are the amazing team behind filming us today and broadcasting us uh, across their YouTube channel. I do have one thing to, to mention. The lectern screen isn't currently showing the slides. Um, I don't know if that can be turned on in preparation for our first speaker. So there you go, everybody at home. We know this is a live event. So I would like to introduce our first speaker, Claire Gott from WSP, WSP who is our sponsor today. Um, come to the stage, Claire, thank you. Thank you very much and uh, nice to see you all um, and thank you for having me. So I thought I'd just by begin by saying actually I started out in your shoes as an undergrad. So although I'm up here on stage, um, you know, we come from exactly the same um, starting point. So hopefully that will give you some tangible points of reference for today's presentation. But in the last 10 years, um, my career has actually evolved from being a chartered civil engineer all the way through to managing multidisciplinary design projects um, and now leading WSP's industry business, which is a 100 strong team um, working across pharmaceuticals, chemicals, gas and hydrogen. And today, I just wanted to give you a bit of an insight into the opportunities and experiences that I have personally enjoyed throughout those 10 years at WSP, but also the opportunities that are there waiting for you all to grab hold of when you graduate. Now, many industries make the claim that they can change the world. But as engineers, we really do help to transform lives to design for the future and make the planet better. And to demonstrate this, today I'm going to take you on a journey through my life as an engineer at WSP. 
So first things first, I should probably explain that I was actually um, inspired to take up a career in engineering um, through humanitarian aid activities. Ever since I was a teenager, I knew that I wanted a career that would enable me to make a difference. And so in my final year at university, I co-founded an independent engineering charity called Cameroon Catalyst. The charity aims to facilitate sustainable development in rural Cameroon. And since 20, 2010, uh, we've delivered a medical center, a school, solar power hub, micro businesses, and more recently, clean water solutions for over 20,000 villagers. And it's our engineering designs that are quite literally transforming the lives, their quality of life, and actually saving lives. For example, we've halved the child mortality rate uh, in one of our particular villages. We've quadrupled the number of children that are attending school. And we've also introduced seven clean drinking water wells. Now, I joined WSP's graduate program because the company's vision and values really struck a chord with me. I knew that they would support my personal passion for transforming lives and make a difference. And that way, I could introduce that into my day-to-day -day role as an engineer. And just five years after joining WSP, my passion for positive, sustainable change was recognised. And I was appointed as the UK head of corporate social responsibility for our 7,000 UK employees. And I continue that role now, having helped evolve it into humanitarian aid support, volunteering for local charities, encouraging fundraising events, but also driving environmental excellence and social value. But one of the other reasons I joined WSP was the global opportunities. We have over 50,000 employees across WSP, and that means that you not only get to work with people from different cultures, but you get to work on projects from really different societies and different end users. And personally, I've enjoyed working in France, Denmark, Canada, and the USA, and also India. But we also get to work across many different sectors. And that's across the built environment. And in WSP in particular, we have four different business units. I've taken the opportunity to proactively work across all of these. Um, and so I do encourage you to, to do that wherever you end up going. Um, so from left to right on the screen, I started out in the property and buildings part of the team. I was designing a steel, steel frame for Older Hay Children's Hospital. I then moved into design management on major infrastructure projects like uh, London Bridge Station redevelopment and High Speed 2. I then supported planning submissions for the likes of the Paddington Cube. And as I said, I now lead the industry business, which works with clients like AstraZeneca, Breed and Cement, and National Grid. And we are, in fact, WSP's global center of excellence for process engineering. But alongside the day job, there are a vast number of opportunities to get involved in some really fantastic initiatives, be that with your institutions, with the press, or with your peers. There is a real community in the engineering industry. So some fun examples from me over the last 10 years. Um, I actually helped the Institution of Civil Engineers to get the Guinness uh, to get in the Guinness uh, Book of World Records, we built a 31 meter long Lego suspension bridge. And for that, I was honored with a mini me Lego, as you can see, so great bit of fun there. Um, I'm also a really proud ambassador for women in engineering and construction. Whether that's through WSP schools engagement programs or championing diversity and inclusion, um, and I was also incredibly honoured uh, in 2015 to receive an MBE from the Queen um, in recognition for services to engineering and charity work. Now, the last few slides of my presentation will look to the future. We've all experienced firsthand through the current pandemic that pharmaceuticals is a rapidly developing sector. 
And at WSP, we were not only part of the COVID-19 Lighthouse Laboratory testing service in Bracknell, but we also designed the Rosalind Franklin Laboratory in Royal Leamington Spa, also known as the Mega Lab. It's one of the world's largest and most innovative diagnostic facilities. This world-class facility is part of the UK's government, the UK government's ongoing response to COVID-19. And it's been created within an existing 250,000 square foot warehouse building to really make sure that sustainability is at the heart of some of those rapid decisions and to help reduce the carbon emissions in its delivery. So as engineers, it's clear that we are responsible for transforming exciting science discoveries into reality by delivering rapid designs and building solutions that are both cost effective, but also provide environmentally friendly processes. So aside from developing vaccines, engineers are also responsible for tackling many of today's global challenges from stem cell to gene therapy to curing blindness. But our biggest challenge is actually designing for flexibility. So being ready for the future. And in order to do that, we've got to accommodate new technology. That's got to be throughout the whole life cycle of our projects, from design all the way through to construction. And so collaboration across engineering disciplines is absolutely vital, whether that be chemical, mechanical, electrical, civil, environmental, or fire. They're all incredibly important. Another area where engineers are helping save the world, quite literally, is through our net zero carbon commitment, which in the UK, for those that you don't know, is to achieve that by 2050. And at WSP, we've actually committed to halving the carbon footprint of all designs that we deliver and advice to, to our clients by 2030. Now it's clear that hydrogen will play a really important role in addressing the world's climate emergency because it has the potential to decarbonize domestic heating, heavy transport, and also the UK's industrial clusters. So one example is uh, we're actually involved in a hydrogen super hub um, in the port of Southampton, where we're working with the gas network company SGN to prepare a feasibility study to investigate opportunities to decarbonise local industry and transport and create a centre of excellence for hydrogen production and distribution through carbon capture and hydrogen based technologies. But it's not just about all the big projects. Um, we actually each have a responsibility to help reduce our own carbon footprint. And I'll cut straight to the point here. Um, we are in a climate crisis and it's up to every single one of us to repair our climate. Our climate. But the really good news is that as engineers, we can choose to see this as a really exciting time where new ideas, new business plans, new technologies are all being encouraged. So in addition to our carbon reduction on projects that I mentioned earlier, at WSP, we're also committed to becoming net zero in our UK operations. And we'll be hitting that target by 2025. That will be through reductions in our emissions on our travel, cutting energy consumption, and also ensuring zero waste to landfill, which we achieved last year. So it's a really exciting time to become an engineer because the only way we're going to tackle net zero challenges is by inviting you, young, talented professionals, to engage with experts, to bring fresh, innovative ideas forward and to bring them to life. So as I said at the start of my presentation, many industries make claim to addressing these key areas. But hopefully the last 10 minutes has helped demonstrate that as engineers, we really do transform lives. So having shown you all the amazing ways that engineers and engineering projects are creating a legacy 
and some of these amazing women at WSP are, are doing just that as well. My parting call to action to you is what will your legacy be? Thank you. Thank you, Claire. That was amazing. Um, and I agree. Also, we can all do our bit um, in reducing our, our footprint, carbon footprint. Um, we're, we're a bit uh, of a stickler for it at home in our, our house. My children have a green bin and a non-green bin and a food waste bin. It's just to, those little things we can all do at home. It doesn't matter how small, we can all make a difference as well. So thank you so much. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Ella Podmore, who is a materials engineer at McLaren, um, but is also the uh, 2020 winner, the IET winner of the Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you everyone for having me here today. These kind of events are fantastic and it's what these events are all about. We're here to talk about women in engineering, empowering women, getting women in science, technology, engineering and maths. So if I can go straight into my presentation, I think we're going to show my video first of all. more to engineering than solving problems and fixing things. So what makes an engineer tick? Growing up, I love science. Experiencing firsthand the impact it had on the world and people around me, I knew early on that I wanted to get involved. There was always this great urge inside of me that strived for performance. But why did I become an engineer? to make something better than anything else, to break records, to go faster. I always push myself and my work to the absolute limit. Sport had always been a channel for this competitive edge. My desire to evolve my process and my practice, being part of a sports team really taught me that some of the smallest changes are often the most important. How pushing yourself can excel entire team to success. That feeling of wanting to be a part of a dynamic team environment, that's what drew me to McLaren. And being the company's first materials engineer, I'm so fortunate that I get to work on some of the world's most advanced materials. The changes that I make are really small, they're microscopic but it is at this microscopic level where we make the difference. And it is here where we're able to make a lightweight car even lighter, and here where we're able to fine tune that product for performance. Working on some of the world's fastest cars makes me feel like part of a materials technology movement. And I want to use this platform to broadcast all the work that those materials engineers are doing on a microscopic level to better industry. For the young girls and boys who are looking to engineering for a career, wondering if it's quite right for them. But for me, more importantly, I want to use this platform to broadcast the work that engineers out there who are doing more than just safety and function. Why not take it to the edge? I have found engineering to be groundbreaking, beautiful, and I cannot wait to see where this winding road takes me next. Thank you so, so much for showing that video. <laughs> it's always um, a bit embarrassing to watch it back, but um, yeah, it's an honor to be here today. Thank you so much for having me here. And 
My name's Ella Podmore. I am one of the lead materials engineers at McLaren Automotive. Um, I was fortunate enough to win Young Women Engineer of the Year 2020, and I'm a STEM ambassador and a general advocate for women in engineering, but also women in automotive um, industries as well. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about what I do what I, um, my journey into the career that I've chosen, what it's like to be a woman in a male dominated industry, and also the kind of things that I've learned along my journey for all of you who are wanting to get into STEM or um, who are wanting to become a materials engineer or even in the automotive industry as well. So this is probably what you would expect me to be doing as a materials engineer in the lab coat on a microscope working on cars um, and this is where i spend about 50 to 60 percent of my time in the lab working on practical experiments and uh, doing that analysis part of uh, the uh, analysis part of the the um, car so I am responsible for all material related investigations in the business, whether it be specking materials right from the design phase when studio engineers are putting pen to paper all the way through to customer cars in the field. It will be my job to make sure that all the materials are performing at the right level, that we're not having any issues, whether we send our cars to Dubai, Sweden, the States, um, they've all got to be performing at a similar level. So 50% of my time is spent in the lab, and the other 50% of my time, he's doing a mic swap. <laughs> um, and the other 50% of my time will be leading things like technical reviews, speaking to engineering departments. It's all part of that communication to make sure that there we go, way. <laughs> um, part of that communication to make sure that all engineering departments are speaking together. So. I came into the business as one of the only material engineers working there. So when I go on to talk about what kind of skills I've learned along the way, communication was a huge part of that. But I also get to do uh, a little nice perk that I know there'll be questions about as well. I get to drive some of the cars as well. So as an engineer working in the automotive industry, it's really, really essential that you get to know your product. And uh, a really small percentage of my time gets to see what, how these cars are performing and experiencing them in the customer environment as well. Like I said, if we're putting cars in high temperature environments, cold temperature environments, as a material scientist, it's important to know that all the materials are going to be performing in the right way under these extreme conditions as well all all whilst contributing to that customer satisfaction that customer experience of a performance car so this is my journey and I like to reflect on how I got to where I am today because I think there are a few things that I have picked up that have been so so crucial to get me to where I am I think when you're looking to get into STEM, whether you're looking to, to study engineering, whatever it may be, there's no right or wrong way to do this. But these, these little tips that I'm going to talk about when picking a course or when um, applying to jobs, assessment centers, whatever it may be, these have definitely helped me. But I am a materials engineer, so no surprise, I studied materials engineering at, at university. I went to Manchester. Um, but what got me into that? So basically, I had a passion for science. Uh, chemistry was my subject. I absolutely loved learning about atoms, molecules, stuff that's really, really small um, that you can pick up on a microscope. Because to me, if you, if you couldn't see it, but it was making such an impact and that's what everything was made out of, that was just absolutely mind blowing. And then throughout school, I knew that I wanted to contribute to something a bit bigger. I wanted to contribute to industry. I wanted to solve problems. And I was fortunate enough to sort of understand that that meant that I wanted to be an engineer. So my passion for chemistry, wanted to get into engineering. What kind of pathways could that open up for me? And I looked into chemical engineering and materials. I did lots of open days, experiences, and that's something I definitely encourage that if you want to uh, find out what sector of it, 
engineering or, or STEM you want to get into, go out and experience it. There are so many different resources available, everything from online to in person to university free courses. It's really, really encouraged that you go out and see what's out there because at the end of the day, we don't study engineering at school. And this is something really, really difficult for students to understand if they, if they wanted to get into the industry because we have no experience of that at school just yet. So materials engineering was for me. I went and did a master's of materials engineering at Manchester. For those of you who are familiar with the university or familiar with materials, it was that buzzword graphene, the isolation of that super material that drew me to this particular uni and its industrial links. Now that brings me on to the kind of course that I chose. I chose materials engineering with industrial experience. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is an opportunity for you to go and work in a company or go and be placed in industry for 12 months as part of your degree. I thought I would like to do this because, you know, it would extend my university experience. I was loving it. Um, I also wanted to, to gain an insight of what industry I wanted to get into. Now, the time came around where I was picking what companies I was signing up to. And at that stage, I was signing up to, to most and everything. I think all of the people in the room who have filled out applications, whether it be jobs, internships, placements, you've got to do a lot of them. And I was signing up to every company under the sun, it felt like. But um, I grew up having a passion for cars. I watched Top Gear with my brothers, with my dad. Um, and cars were sort of always in the background. Grand Prix, for instance, I always watched. I was into sport like that. And I had a big poster of a McLaren P1 on my bedroom wall. And when I was signing up to all these internships, I thought, why not? Looking at this poster, I was like, why not combine both passions here? So studying materials I want to do an internship in materials placement um, and I like that car <laughs> that's my favorite car um, so I took a chance and I wrote to McLaren they didn't have an opening for me um, I was a materials engineer and at that stage, the company was looking to automotive, mechanical engineers, um, and three or four months passed, and I got a call from McLaren saying, okay, come down for an interview. And for those of you who know what the offices are like, it's so overwhelming, it's James Bond territory. And I got there and basically proved to them that I know a bit about cars, but more importantly, I can bring a lot of material expertise to the business. And I think there's something really useful that we can take from that. So they took a chance on me and I had to prove myself for those 12 months. And what this internship allowed me to do, so f first lesson there really, I think, is to go for it. They didn't have an opening. I wrote a letter. I sent my CV off um, with no automotive experience. I don't study mechanical engineering. Um, and if you have a company like that, that you really want to work for, why not send a letter? What have you got to lose? Secondly, with these internships, with these placement years, I was able to gain a fantastic insight into how that industry operated. So as a materials engineer, I was constantly on the lookout to what kind of problems or what kind of issues the engineering um, teams in the automotive industry were battling with. And for me, I took this problem away and I, I said to McLaren, look, I'm going to complete my master's if I come up with a solution to this particular problem could you offer me a job? <laughs> and that's kind of how it went. So they said, yep, yeah, okay, if you can, you can get a first and you can uh, provide a solution to this particular problem, uh, then we'll have a job for you. And they created the Department of Materials Engineering and I've been there for four years now. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that industrial placement year was really, really key for me becoming that desirable candidate when I graduate uni. It's also fantastic to have a thesis topic that gives you purpose, something that you can contribute towards rather than just a, a subject the university has given you. So look out for that one. But here is probably a few images that you weren't expecting a materials engineer to be a part of. So the, the laboratory picks, the working on the microscope, that's something that you'll probably think that, yes, okay, I can see a materials engineering do. But it's so much more than that. And that's kind of what I want to demonstrate on this slide. We talk a lot about soft skills and what you learn, um, but that you accompany with your studying, something that you contribute towards outside of the classroom. But having recently been through this process, and having recently um, been fortunate enough to win this um, Young Women Engineer of the Year Award, I cannot stress how important these soft skills are, whether it be communication, leadership, teamwork. It is 
that is that is what makes an amazing engineer you can be a fantastic scientist you can be one of the the best researchers in the room but if you want to be an engineer you're contributing towards a company an industry a team and it's these soft skills that have really really helped me along my way and I've been really really lucky as you can tell I've been a part of some fantastic opportunities I think one of the proudest ones sorry IET has had got to be that blue piece of badge that was an amazing <laughs> childhood dream that I was fortunate enough to do last year but meeting incredible people Claire touched upon it earlier traveling the world being a role model in this industry is something that has really opened up loads of opportunities for me so continue those soft skills make sure that you're balancing your studying along with these soft skills that um you may pick up in hobbies, team sports, art, musical instruments, whatever it may be. It shows discipline, time management. These are all the things that are going to shape you into that fantastic engineer and ready for the STEM world. So next, I'm going to talk about changing the narrative. So this is something that I like to talk about in all of my presentations, because I think when we talk about women in engineering, we always talk about the gender disparity. So it is no secret that there are more uh, male roles in the more male role models in the world of engineering there's a, a greater proportion of men especially in the automotive industry but I don't want this to be framed as a negative. So for me, when I talk to kids, when I go and uh, do my STEM ambassador jobs and I go to schools and stuff, I want us to rewrite the way that we uh, translate this to kids. So I want to change that narrative because this is a picture of me standing with my um, YWE uh, trophy. This was put in McLaren's trophy cabinet and it was one of the only female trophies in that trophy cabinet. So I don't see that. I see that as an opportunity that's not something to be negatively looked upon this is something that has motivated me every day I find myself I'm the only woman in the room but I don't see that as a negative I see it as something that makes me want to prove every single one of them that I can do the job better or it makes me puts me in a spotlight that I really really want to use and I wouldn't have been given half the opportunities that I have been through if I wasn't the only woman in the room so really let it motivate you so we should talk about the reason for why we want to encourage female participation, increase female visibility in engineering as a positive one. Of course, we always need more role models. It's recent recent study saying that about 70% more likely girls are to take up a subject if they see a role model working in that industry or working in that job role. Um, so this is something that's absolutely a given, but I think the main point that we should be teaching as parents, mothers, um, uh, employers, we should be saying that it's a positive movement that we've got to get women into this. And even being involved in industry myself, we can talk about it as diversification of the workforce. So if if we are wanting to create a more diverse product, if we want to sell cars to more than just men, we want to sell them to all, all people across the world in all different regions, then we've got to have that reflection in the workforce. How can we design a product that's so diverse if we don't have a diverse workforce? So this is, again, another reason why we've got to encourage female participation in STEM. And last point there, industries are changing. And this I'm noticing hugely as we push towards electrification, as we want to create products that are more diverse, we're having to widen the, the gates where we encourage talent into these types of industries. And this is definitely something we see the, in the automotive industry quite traditionally. I mean, prior to me joining there, there was no materials engineer in the business. But as we move towards um, computing and software, we're seeing a significant uptake of more females in, in the company as well. So this is something that we really want to encourage. Um, and again, it's a positive. Industries are not just staying in their lane anymore. And it's a really, really encouraging fact that we're now looking towards computer science scientists, software engineers, material engineers, chemical engineers to contribute to cars. And that's only going to get better. 
So I just want to finish on a positive note. Why, why engineering? I mean, all of you tuning in today are obviously involved in the engineering sector. You're wanting to get into it. You're aspiring students. I just want to give you confidence that this is a fantastic career path. You are not going to be disappointed. The way that the UK is moving, the way that technology is moving, there's a huge demand for engineers. And what I hope to have demonstrated is in that presentation is that the skill sets that what we stereotype an engineer to have and what you actually turn out to, to, to gain from studying engineering or being part of that sector are so, so different. Um, I've been so fortunate enough with everything that I've done, but this could be you. This is what engineers do. We talk about our craft. We really make a difference in the world, like Claire suggested in the presentation before. And it's really, really exciting. So I encourage everyone to, to join STEM and to be a part of the, the engineering movement in the UK. Brilliant. Do we have time for a few questions? We have time <laughs> for a few questions. So what a motivating presentation. We have a few questions from social media. Um, we have a question coming in and they speak about women typically creating their own glass ceiling and what brought you to stay out of the lane uh, and breaking those glass ceiling barriers yourself? Yeah, no, it's a really important topic. Um, I'm glad people are asking this kind of question because we need to talk about it, right? Um, I suggested in the presentation that it's kind of a change in mindset. So for us to say that you're not going to have barriers being a woman in this industry would be lying. You know, we've got to be honest. Um, there is significant change in the, the the female uptake of these subjects. But if we were to sit around and for wait, waiting for equality in this workforce, we're going to be waiting years. So I want to change the way that people think about it and I think you've got to you've got to change it out of that negativity and you've really got to let it motivate you and I think how I was able to do that I mean honestly it was a learning curve <laughs> I'm not saying that I walked into McLaren and I was like oh yeah this is brilliant you know I went through all the other the challenges that I think um, young women do when they're entering a, a professional environment I thought I had to be really tough. I thought I had to be very masculine um, to get my point across, to get people to listen, to fit in. And that's not the case at all. But we've got to stop looking at it as being a negative thing that's holding you back. In actual fact, when you are wanting to be the first to do something, breaking that glass ceiling, see it as an opportunity. So you're going to be in the spotlight. That's a given. Let it motivate you. Let you have that drive and that passion and be brave to... to turn that into something where you're going to make a name for yourself and that's the, the way that I was able to talk things and honestly I've had as many people do you know I've had struggles with um with uh bringing my individuality to my job because there weren't many role models that I could look to but you've really got to make it your own and just let it motivate you <laughs> Thank you, Ella. Um, another question from the emails. Uh, so what can teachers, parents and friends do to promote young women into engineering? Great question. I love the, the fact that people are wanting to make a difference. This is what this event is all about. Um, how can we impact this? How can we make things move? And I always sort of have a few key takeaway points when people ask me about this. And we talked about one already, and that's changing the narrative. So with young kids, and I'm talking really, really young primary school ages, we want to make sure that we are not um, tending towards those stereotypes. We want to change the way that we uh, let girls play with dolls and boys play with tractors, for, uh, for example. So changing the narrative is really, really important. Encourage female participation. So this to me is a big one. When I go to visit schools, I, s I tend to have more success going to like a, a female only group of career advisories or um, giving advice in a small group of um, young female students. I've just noticed that works better. They're more forthcoming with how they ask questions. Um, they're more interested and uh, have, have greater confidence in asking questions and basically finding out more about the industry. Um, and so increasing female participation whether it's that's the events you run whether that's the the friends you introduce to your child or whatever you expose them to I've found that definitely helps 
changing the narrative, increasing female participation, increasing visibility as well. Now, this is a big one because we do have females out there smashing it, doing incredible things in the engineering industry, and we need to highlight them. And I'll never forget in my IT class back at, back at school, we had an IT teacher put big posters of female in, in tech, females in uh, Silicon Valley, just like big um, business women figures. And I didn't know they existed. I literally, I remember looking at Sheryl Sandberg and being like, this is incredible. I can't believe like they're out there making movements in, in huge businesses like this. So increasing female visibility because they are out there and we know that role models do help. And then also create those opportunities, whether it be after school clubs, whether it be um, setting up a a quick uh, coffee chat with one of your uh, friends, making network connections to help out people who want to get into the industry, creating the opportunities there. So four points, changing narrative, encourage female participation, increase the visibility and create those opportunities. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ella, that's amazing. Um, and amazing that you, your teacher was a forward thinker and sharing those women stereotype, women role models for you growing up and you were able to see that. Uh, we know from hearing from other speakers, that's not always the case in the school. So thank you for being a change maker. Thank you for being a, an amazing role model at McLaren, but also for, for the STEM industry as a whole. Um, so I want to move on to our next speaker now um, from MBDA. We've got Becky Sims, who's going to be joining us virtually. Um, so uh, over to you, Becky. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm hoping you can all hear me OK. Um, welcome to, to today's event. Um, I hope you're all enjoying it so far. I've seen some of the messages coming through in the chat. Uh, and you all seem really engaged, which is fabulous. Um, so today I'm going to give you a very quick overview of my career so far alongside um, my role at MBDA and some of the stuff that we're doing as a company to encourage uh, people like yourselves into engineering. Um, so if you wouldn't mind bringing up the first slide for me, please. Should have some slides. Okay, well, whilst, whilst we're waiting for those to come up, um, just a bit of an introduction to me. So my name's um, Becky, and I'm a senior process engineer at MBDA Missile Systems. Um, I graduated from Loughborough University in 2019 um, with a master's in mechanical engineering. Um, so where I'm at, at the moment, like I say, I'm a senior process engineer at MBDA. Um, I also look after all the outreach work um, at the Bolton site, which is where I work. So this is things such as going into schools, colleges, universities and doing STEM events. Um, we run a work experience scheme at MBDA as well. So, so I look after all of that. Um, and I'm also the um, communications lead for our neurodiversity committee um, at, the, at the company as well. Um, for me, uh, the, the way that engineering started and my interest was when I was growing up, I was always interested in, in how things work. I was pretty good at maths and physics um, and just wanted a, a job that involved that, but I wasn't really sure what to do. And then I figured out that actually doing engineering, doing a STEM subject, I could do pretty much whatever I wanted to do. And there's so many different opportunities available to you. Um, obviously, Ella's just been talking about her career and how she, she did materials. I did mechanical engineering at university. Um, so much stuff out there. Um, I've seen on the chat already that loads of you are doing so many different courses, whether you're doing undergrad degrees, PhDs, anything in between. Um, so that's absolutely fantastic. So for me, um, whilst I was doing my degree at Loughborough, I did some placement work as well. So I spent a bit of time at Rolls-Royce in Derby, uh, a company called JLG, and at JCB in, in Staffordshire. And what I realized through doing all of those was actually, again, there's so much stuff to be involved in. Um, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, and, and that's okay. 
Um, so I did a summer placement at MBDA uh, before my final year and I was working in the Warheads department doing design and I absolutely loved the company. I loved the culture. I really, really wanted to come back, but the job wasn't for me. And I was a little bit worried about, well, what do I do? I really, really want to work at this company, but the job isn't for me. And I just made those connections. I talked to people, those softer skills that Ella was mentioning in, in her speech. It's all about those communications and that networking. And I was actually able to secure my place on our manufacturing graduate scheme. Um, so even though it wasn't the job that I'd gone in for initially, it was the company and the MBDA's company culture that drew me to it. Um, so it kind of just highlights that actually, if you start a job and you're not really loving it and you want to do something else, there's absolutely no issues with that at all. And um, there's so much different stuff out there within STEM and within engineering um, that you can basically do whatever you want. Um, so if you want my popping onto the next slide for me, please. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about as well um, within MBDA, we have a network called space to be So this is our gender equality network. Um, and it's all about ensuring that everybody is given the equal opportunities that they need to progress. Um, so nobody's gender is getting in the way of their opportunities to progress. Um, you can see our vision and, and mission on the screen there, um, but it's essentially all about championing diversity. And we're trying to do loads of events um, within the company just to encourage more people into engineering. This is not just, not just females, this is anybody. Um, but one thing that I would completely echo is what Ella was saying about, you know, spreading the word, not putting those stereotypes in there, encouraging people, even from a really young age, to, to do what they want to do. Um, and that's something that we're trying to do to do with our network as well. Um, so very quick whistle stop tour of, of my journey and a little bit of what we're doing at the company. Um, if anyone has any questions about either the company, about my career, um, feel free to, to get in touch. Um, we also have a MBDA careers website as well, where those of you that are looking for, um, whether it be summer placements, undergraduate schemes, graduate schemes, apprenticeships, any of those sorts of things, have a look on our careers website um, and, and just see if there's anything that you want to do. Um, but mainly I'd just say, keep going with what you're doing, you know, get your academics sorted, but also all those other things that Ella mentioned as well. Um, so enjoy the rest of the event. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Becky. That was amazing. And I'd love to echo that, actually. Um, we always feel that when we've done a degree in certain thing that we absolutely must go and, and follow up and do a career in that. It's not the case. And I think engineering opens up a huge different world to moving across try something out if you don't like it move on find out what other avenues there are to explore within your organization so thank you again becky so i want to um just announce that we are running slightly um over so we're going to have a quick um comfort break now on the screen behind me um you will see what's coming up we've got loads of um fantastic speakers and insight sessions for you to join in on um thank you for your questions and comments so far please keep them coming in that's amazing and remember um in about 30 seconds we're going to be profiling on screen the first woman um, for the competition. So please make a note of her. Oh, there she is now. Um, and remember to, to pop that in your email ready if you want to enter the competition, courtesy of Mott McDonald, to win £500 for your university society.
Hi, welcome back. I hope you got yourself a drink and you made a note of um, that famous woman, um, incredible trailblazer there. So um, we are moving on to our next session now with Mott McDonald. We are joined uh, on the stage with Lucy Hines, who's um, from the Early Talent Careers team, and Millie Ramplin, who is a fire engineer and has done the graduate programme. So we'll be talking firsthand, but we're going to run to a video first. I enjoy that video. That's Ken, Ken the dog, our new mascot. Um, so I'm Lucy. I'm in the early careers team um, and sort of, uh, sort of supporting with recruiting all of our graduates, placement students, and apprentices. And um, I'm going to be quizzing Millie here on her experience of studying engineering and starting um, a job as an engineer um, at Mark McDonald. Hi, um, I'm Millie, obviously, and um, I'm a fire engineer. I've been with Mark McDonald now for three years. As Amanda said, I've finished the, the graduate 
part of my uh, my career's development. Fire engineering um, is quite a niche sector of engineering. Um, it's I work in building services with architects and helping with the design and development of fire strategies for buildings to make sure that there are sufficient means for escape. Um, I do a lot of smoke modelling to model how fire moves around buildings, etc., and work with the fire brigade. So I'm going to start quizzing you now on your experiences. So um, I'm sure many engineering students watching this will want to know how studying engineering differs to working as an engineer. Um, I think it varies it varies as much as it's similar. So when I started studying engineering, I thought I knew what I wanted to do at the end of my degree. I wanted to go into Formula One, um, and that was, that was the end goal. Um, but through my degree, I kind of learned how to learn about different topics of engineering, and it just became apparent to me that there are so many disciplines within, within the engineering field. I studied mechanical engineering. Um, so I think during my degree, I learned how to learn. And since I've started work, rather than learning about how to do my job through my degree, I've learned how to, to apply my learning at work. And having started my career with Mark McDonald, I've learned how to apply that knowledge at work. Thank you. And so we know there are many sectors that engineers can specialise in uh, once they've graduated. So how did, you go, how did you go about deciding that fire engineering was for you? I hadn't heard of fire engineering at the beginning of my degree. Um, as I said, I wanted to go into cars. That was my kind of passion. Um, but I did my third year abroad in Australia, and um, the topic of fire engineering was brought up. It sounded cool. Um, and so I kind of looked into it a bit more. I did a lot of these events. Um, I, it kind of became apparent to me that I had no idea what I wanted to do at the end of my degree. Um, so I looked into fire engineering a bit more, and then I chose it as one of my disciplines in my fifth year of my master's degree. Um, and it kind of coincided with the, the Grenfell Inquiry and things like that. And it was very topical, and I kind of latched on to the um, aspiration to make an impact. And I, yeah, I really enjoyed working as a fire engineer because it is niche and it is specialist, but I do feel like I am I'm helping. Yeah, that must be a really rewarding part of the job. And so you've, you've been with us a few years now. You've, you've completed the graduate program, so you're no longer officially a graduate. Um, so what next? What are your career goals? Um, interesting question. I, I think for me personally, I like to keep, well, I think I need to keep my career goals quite, um, quite short term. Um, because it feels like school is a finite period of time. You know what to expect after school. Mm -hmm. um, and after school, you go to university, that's X number of years, or you do an apprenticeship, or you do whatever in X, but it's, it's a discrete amount of time, whereas a career is it's the first time in your life where you've got something that's going to last you, you know, for the duration of a career. So um, I'm trying to keep it short term. I'm aiming for my chartership. That's, that's the next thing on mm. the horizon. And then beyond that, we'll, I will think after that. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> So um, for any students watching this, are there any particular resources that, that, we, that you know that the universities provide that um, engineering students should sort of, sort of take advantage of or tap into? So yeah, what, what do universities provide that you recommend that they, uh, they look for? The career service. I mean, I can only speak from my experience. I went to Edinburgh University, which had a fantastic career service, um, but I, I think they're available at every university, you know, and they're such a good resource to tap into, ask about events like this, attend as many events like this as you can, apply for internships, to just get a feel for which sector A you want to go into, but what kind of career you want. Do you want to be a consultant sitting down and a meeting with people and discussing topics? Do you want to be designing? Do you want to be researching? There are so many things to think about, so really tapping into the career service that you have available to you at university is, is key. Thank you. And did you get involved with any extracurricular activities that you recommend other engineering students look into that will help strengthen their applications? I did a bit of everything. I like activities and doing things that aren't engineering outside my engineering life. Um, that's not for everyone. I did, I did start with Formula One 
uh, for being a student, sorry, um, in the first year and second year of my degree because I thought that would kind of promote my CV, you know. And I think it does, but I think more importantly, it's what you do in your spare time and it's how you write about what you do in your spare time and how you demonstrate your passions, whether it's related to engineering, outside engineering, whatever it is, but it's how you convey your passion for whatever it is you're doing that is important rather than what you do. Okay, thanks. So um, just thinking about your application experience. So um, I'm sure that you realised when you were coming towards the end of your degree that actually there were lots of companies that you could have applied to. Did you apply to lots of organisations? How did you research? Um, you know, did you select a few? And this is a long question, but then at the, at the end of that process, you were offered the job with Mott McDonald, and why did you select that, that position? Um, I heard a lot about Mark McDonald when I was at uni. Mark McDonald um, came, like, graduates came to speak to us at the University of Edinburgh in particular. Um, career, they were there at the careers events. Um, so I had heard a lot about Mark McDonald, um, but I'd also heard about the other large consultancies, and I did apply to several because it's like the application process is tough. Um, and when I was offered the job with Mark McDonald, I was aware that I personally wanted to start my career with a larger company. Um, I knew about Mark McDonald's, you know, work-life balance, like the importance of the work-life balance. Um, my partner at the time, he was going through a job which was all hours of the day kind of work. And I knew I'd, I wanted to focus more on having some kind of balance that way. And so that was something I valued. And I only knew that through going to the events. So that is why I chose Mark McDonald. And yeah, well, when I have my... Well, yeah. <laughs> here. So we've actually whizzed through those, but I have got some backup questions. Um, I might just ask one more if that's okay. So um, we, we talk about communication skills quite a lot and it always comes up in application forms. It comes up in interviews. Um, but, but when you're actually a design engineer such as yourself, are, is that a key skill? And um, how do you kind of use it in, in your job as an engineer? Um, communication is key. Um, I think the difference between communication at university uh, that I have found going into the workplace is that it's, it's key in all stages of your development. At university, it was much more informal. At work, obviously, you're meeting with clients, you're speaking with colleagues, and suddenly communication becomes more about effective communication and demonstrating confidence in what you're doing, I think, which is something that I am definitely still learning. Because it's one thing to, to go into a meeting and not know about a topic and convince someone you do. I think we all know that's what a lot of people do. <laughs> um, but equally, I have had been in situations where I can convince someone I don't know about a topic, mm. <laughs> where I did. Um, and that's a learning curve to learn to be confident in what you're, you're saying and what you're thinking and your ideas. Fabulous. Yeah, that's, those, that's right through university, I guess, and then straight into the world of work as well. But um, thank you. That was really interesting. Some good insights there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And there were a lot of questions that have come in on the thread. But in about three minutes, we're going to be going on to the panel discussion. And I think there... They're great questions for the whole panel. So um, we're just going to hear um, a, a brief video now from Alexandra Knight, um, who is the founder and CEO of Stamazing. Um, she's also on the Where's Women Engineering Society um, as well. And she's going to be talking about the benefits of being involved in that. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a chartered engineer and fellow of the IMECE. I'm the founder and CEO of Stamazing Limited, a social enterprise dedicated to inspiration and inclusion in STEM. I'm also a trustee on the board of directors of the Women's Engineering Society, the charity that created INWED, International Women in Engineering Day, the day every year on the 23rd of June where we recognise and celebrate women engineers and the incredible contributions they make to society all around the world. Organisations like WES are so critical to supporting female engineers. 
Being in the minority as a woman in engineering can be tough at times. So joining a supportive and empowering community of women engineers, like we have at WES, is so incredibly valuable. I personally have benefited so much from being a member of WES, from the amazing support network and friends I've made in the clusters of WES, through to knowledge sharing and building my own professional network at conferences, um, through to opportunities to build my own profile and my skills and do more to support and champion women in engineering, which is really important to me. So it's made an enormous difference to me and something that I'm really, really proud of and I know it benefits thousands of other women. So definitely something I would recommend doing. My favourite thing about my career, well, I love the fact that everything I have done in my career has made a tangible difference. From designing novel rehabilitation equipment for injured soldiers, to improving energy distribution in Thailand, to digitising our national critical infrastructure, to healthcare innovations for people with dementia and so much more. I've had such an unbelievably varied range of engineering experience using my problem solving skills. And every single thing I have been lucky enough to work on has made life better in some way for someone. And on top of that, I've had a ball doing it. I've worked with so many genuinely amazing people who are so talented in so many ways and that's the beauty of engineering. It's people with diverse skills and experiences coming together to innovate and problem solve. And when a team comes together and works well together like that, it is pure magic. I have experienced some challenges in my field as a woman engineer in the minority most of the time. This can bring some challenges. Um, I've experienced people assuming I'm there to take notes when actually I'm there to run the meeting, um, being told I'm too pretty to be an engineer, others taking credit for my ideas, being talked over, people suggesting I've got the opportunities I've had just because I'm a woman, things like that. So all of these things can absolutely destroy your confidence and make you question if you even belong in this male dominated field. But I've chosen to focus on the positive impact I can have and be a champion for myself and other women in STEM. So we can drive towards a more diverse and inclusive culture in engineering. If I could give women starting out in their career in engineering a piece of advice, my advice would be say yes to things that scare you. Have the courage to take opportunities that grow your confidence as well as your competence. Because it's only by stepping out of your comfort zone that you will stretch yourself and realise your potential. So you have to champion yourself and others. And even when you're early in your career, you can still be a leader and lead by example as a visible role model. We can all empower each other to be the best we can be. And by joining a membership community like WES, you will meet many amazing women engineers that will inspire you throughout every stage in your career. You have the power to make a real difference through engineering and together, we can make it a thriving, diverse and inclusive environment that cultivates people who will then create the STEM solutions of tomorrow to benefit everyone. Excellent, thank you. Um, really second that as well. So um, women in, Women's Engineering Society is um, a society at quite a few universities now. So if you're not a member, look it up to see if it's a society active at your university and join it. If you'd like to get involved further, contact them and uh, maybe set up, set up a society uh, for them. Uh, so we're moving on. Um, we're still pushing for time. So we're moving straight on to the panel discussion now. And I'm joined on stage by Mel Clark from WSP, 
Lucy Hines, who we've just seen from Mott McDonald, and Georgie Rutter from GSK. And virtually joining us, we've got Cherie and Najab from BP. There she is. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is all about you guys and the questions. We've had so many questions coming in, which is fabulous. Um, so I'm going to head straight over to you guys. Please, can you give us a brief introduction um, and we'll get straight on to the questions. Yeah, of course, I'm happy to go first. Um, my name is Mel Clark. I'm the Recruitment and Development Manager at WSP. I'm responsible for all of the recruitment and early careers development programmes that we have as an organisation. I'm Lucy Hines. I'm an early careers talent acquisition advisor, so work in a team that recruits all of the graduates, placement students and apprentices for the UK and Ireland part of Mott McDonald. I'm Georgie Rutter. I'm one of the Automation Engineering Future Leaders at GSK. I'm Sharon Jam, and um, I am a Planning and Prioritisation Engineer uh, working at BP for everything, global, global BP. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to keep looking down because I've got questions <laughs> coming in on the thread here. So what's quite nice about today's panel is we, we've got a mix of people who have done a graduate scheme or maybe on the graduate scheme and also people from early careers talent team, which is great because we've got a real mix of questions going on. So uh, the first one, could be, uh, I'm going to start with uh, Georgie actually, um, and then maybe Shireen, uh, if anybody else wants to answer. How many graduate, how many companies did you apply to uh, after graduation before getting your role that you're in now? Um, so I would say I started, because I got the graduate scheme for GSK fairly early on after I applied. I started applying for probably in the region of 15 to 20 companies just because you really want to start and see the process. And even if you start a process and then halfway through, you realize maybe that company's not for you. All of the practices, good practice for interviews. So yeah, I did apply to a lot of them, but um, I was lucky enough to get the job in about January. So <laughs> I didn't have to continue on with it for too long. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was about three or four um, and, um, you know, a similar experience. I pretty much blitzed every different <laughs> type of company you could think of, uh, trying to get some experience. And um, based on that, I got into BP that way. And um, they offered me a graduate placement uh, based on the work that I completed during my internship. So I had quite a diverse uh, pool that I applied for. And I echo that similarly in terms of the more you apply for things, the um, more experience you'll get with uh, filling in the application and also the interviews as well. Um, the more experience you get, you start to feel a little bit more confident as well as you kind of go through different processes. Excellent. Um, and one more for the recruiters, actually, the next one is what advice would you offer um, people going through the application process, particularly, and we've had a couple that are doing the nod to COVID. I don't know if your practices are different during COVID in terms of the application through to on assessment centres and onboarding and so forth. Do you want to go first or shall I? <laughs> so you can go I'll go. Okay, I've got a couple of things. So in terms of advice, um, if you're applying to, well, even if you're just applying for a handful of companies or lots, just pay attention to those application deadlines. Um, we have um, a three-stage process um, which you go through before you even come for your interview, um, and they all have a deadline. Each stage is about five days, and it's quite a, a shame when we see how many people drop out of the process or miss deadlines. Um, we have to be really fair to everybody that sticks to them. So we do lose candidates that put their initial application in, were sent the assessments to complete at home, for example, forgot about them or didn't plan their time very well and then got, unfortunately, a message to say, we're not proceeding because you've missed the deadline. So just pay attention to deadlines, plan your time. Um, I know that you know it's a really busy time it's not the best time to be applying for jobs because exams happen in kind of december and january and that's you know a lot of organizations are open then so keep your eye on deadlines and plan your time and the thing about the the covid um 
we switch to um, I mean, our, our, most of our most of our vacancies, the the, the sort of um, assessment bit, the, the interview bit, is just one stage. Um, sort of, we used to call it face-to-face, -face, um, strength-based interview. Some parts of the business do assessment centres, which is project managers and management consultancy. But on the whole, it's a, a kind of an interview. We switch to video interviews using Teams, and actually, we're probably going to stick with it because. Um, you know, candidates are applying for jobs all over the country and it just means you don't have to travel miles and, you know, watch the carbon footprint and spend loads of money on travel and, and put yourself up in a hotel and all that kind of thing. And, you know, if you've got a candidate that lives around the corner from the office and someone who's travelled all day, it might not be a particularly fair experience because somebody might be exhausted, somebody might be feeling fresh because they've just got out of bed. So um, we're probably going to stick with video interviews for most of our um, interviews moving forward. Anything you want to add? Um, I suppose I'd just add on advice around attention to detail with your application and just checking the application and that's really hard when Georgie mentioned you might be applying to 10, 20 companies along the way and it, I'm sure it's very difficult to maintain motivation when you're putting in those applications. You want to probably utilise the same words for each of them and, and I would just make sure that you pay attention to detail and do think about tailoring at least some of your application to the organisation and role that you're applying for. That will make you stand out. Um, and similarly, we are maintaining quite a lot of our um, online process from, from post-COVID scenario. Um, we will be doing online interviewing. So there are lots of hints and tips available online for how to manage that advice and guidance for if, perhaps if you're living in shared accommodation to, to ask those that live with you to not interrupt you during the time to be testing devices and Wi-Fi and things like that where you can do so um, certainly yeah, be prepared for those those online activities and events but as, as has already been said that is a positive thing in some cases because it really does open up those opportunities. Perfect thank you and um, on the being prepared just a simple calendar reminder, I think. Uh, I, I live my life by um, scheduling calendar uh, appointments just to make sure I don't miss deadlines. It doesn't have to be super complicated. Um, I've got a request for all of the employers, actually, that are in the virtual chat. If you do have hints and tips on applying for um, your schemes, please post the link in the chat now. That'd be really, really helpful. Um, Georgie, did you join during the pandemic or was it after? No, I joined during. So I joined September of 2020. Um, so I've only like? been there about a year. <laughs> so it was an interesting time to join. Um, luckily in the role I'm in, I got to go on site, but it, most of the people at my site weren't on site, which meant it was almost a bit of a ghost town when I first joined. I didn't meet a load of people who started at the same time as me until about seven or eight months into the programme. But um, yeah, GSK definitely made accommodations and we had loads of like, where we had tea now, so we met up for cups of tea virtually and stuff like that. So we definitely all managed to still meet and get to know each other, but it was very, it was a very odd scenario. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, and in terms of the application and the, um, did you have to do a virtual assessment centre and virtual interview? No, I just missed out on that because I got my job January of 2020. Right. So, <laughs> so I just annoyingly, missed out. you had to do it in person. <laughs> yeah, I still did it in person, yes. <laughs> and so, Shuri, I don't know if there's anything that you can add in terms of when you joined BP. Um, was that during the pandemic as well or were you saved by that? Um, I'll take that as a great compliment. I joined BP almost 11 years ago in 2010. So, uh, you know, well before the <laughs> pandemic hit, during the recession, really. Um, so, uh, I've been in the company for quite some time. A bit of different experience there in terms of economic struggles, I guess, uh, during that time period. But um, we do still, I think, uh, adhere to, to the virtual interviews at the minute, uh, even though we're hopefully coming out the back end. <laughs> and how, have you, how are you all finding it, um, onboarding new colleagues virtually? I think it, it, the thing is, none of us knew this was coming. <laughs> so we had to be just so, we had to be so adaptable. And that's one of the strengths that we actually look for. It's one of the key strengths that we um, assess candidates on. And that was before, COVID. So um, it's amazing how the business just 
just roll, we rolled with it really. Um, I think it's a real shame for any early careers professional joining a business over the last 18 months because um, so much of it is networking and you know listening to those conversations that are going on in an office whether it's you know open plan generally these days and some of the stuff that the senior engineers are getting involved with just to kind of miss all of that so um, I mean we, we spoke a lot to the business about what they should be doing and, and we as far as we, we were aware it happened which was keep checking in and as soon as we were able you know, we weren't. We were probably allowed back into coffee shops before we were allowed into the office. So we were saying, you know, just invite your graduates or your apprentices or even just you know your colleagues in for a, have a coffee, go for a walk around your local park, and you know it's really intimidating time for some of these people that have have never really had that kind of working environment to um, to kind of continuing working online about all of the onboarding and then to come in and then do a job in front of other people. So um, that's kind of what we did. And now we're, 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 we're back, we're, we're open. And um, if, if early, you know, if the graduates want a desk five days a week, there is one for them. And the business Amazing. has been told, you know, be there a couple of days Great. a week because they don't want to sit by themselves. Exactly. <laughs> um, and on that, actually, so I talked earlier about how office culture's changing. It's changing loads. And it's not because there's less people in there. It's companies have really embraced this um, expression of your own true self. Um, come to the office, you know, two or three days a week, whatever you're comfortable with, wear what you want, um, you know. So things are starting to change a lot in the culture within workplaces. And we've had a great question in, in terms of obviously now assessment centres are virtually virtual. A lot of companies aren't doing assessment centres as often now as well. Is there a way that your company does or you're planning to um, show a real insight into what your organisation's like in terms of its culture before somebody joins the organisation? That's a, a great question and I, I can talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done in our process. Um, you're absolutely right, the culture has shifted massively. I think um, the time that people spend in offices has been used for collaboration, um, whereas previously it would have been used for everything. Um, in our assessment process, we at WSP, we are still running assessment centres, we're doing those virtually online. Um, as part of our assessment centre process, we have, um, very similar to this actually, a Q&A and a panel session with some of our existing graduates. Um, and we do those in particular parts of the business that students would work in if they were successful in, in their application. So I think that that really gives them an insight into what that part of the business is like. We don't have any of the hiring managers or any of the recruitment team sat in those sessions, so they can ask whatever questions they would like to and get a real insight into what it's like to be a graduate at WSP. I think um, without the ability to visit our offices, that's, that's really important, um, and we'll certainly be doing more sessions like that. The other benefit that we've had is being able to add in additional sessions, webinars and, and open sessions like that that are now much more popular online. So I think all of those kind of activities that, that students and graduates can join, I'd definitely encourage them to do so to, to get that insight into the culture. Excellent. Has anybody got anything else to add to that one? Uh, I think uh, a lot of the, because of COVID, uh, one good thing that's also happened is there's a lot more virtual um, uh, material online. Uh, for example, within BP, we do have discovery days, uh, but also things like boost events to kind of help um, develop students in terms of helping them with things like CVs, etc. But I think um, the good thing that's kind of come out of a lot of this is the amount of material to be able to get an idea about the culture of the company, because I think that's quite important. And it's one of the things that can really attract you into and also ingrain you into the company. And having an insight into that, I think, will also be um, a good tip within things like interviews, because then you can bring out those aspects of the culture that you've seen online from the different companies. Um, so if you have a wander onto the, the different websites and you know within BP there's, there's quite a, an expansive uh, array of material out there. Um, but look at things like if they've got any um, you know 
code of conduct or ways of working, um, they usually highlight that quite a lot uh, in different areas on their site. Um, so I think that's one of the, the things that has actually come out of this. It's a lot more virtual material there that some, I think pre-pandemic, you probably wouldn't have been able to get unless you actually went and you know spoke to someone as well. And I've got, thank you. Um, I've got something to add on that. I have seen a lot more employer content, employee-led content as well, that's being shared out on social as well as being really prominent on com companies' websites as well. Um, whereas in the past, it used to be quite corporate. You'd have a corporate video. It is more about this is who we are, this is us, and these are some real life questions that um, graduates are answering. And I found that really, really helpful. And I'm not the, the candidate looking for the job. Um, so I do think that's important. Has anybody else got anything to add to that question? No, but what you were saying about sort of content, I think you're right because um, I'm not sure about GSK and, and WSP, but certainly Mott McDonald's website is, they're written for clients and um, and it's really informative. It talks a lot about our sectors and things like that. But um, we're, you know, I think I think if you're researching the organisation you're going to go and work for, don't just sit on the their main website because that's probably you're probably not their main audience. Go and look for that career section because that's when you're going to really get to grips with what it's like to work for the organisation. They really are two different things. The, the, the service you're going to receive as a client and, and actually being a member of staff, that's where you're going to really get the information that you're looking for. That would be my advice. And I find as well, social channels for each company mm. have a, a, a less formal um, approach as well and tend to pop those videos on there. So check out the social channels for each of the employers. Um, we've got um, another question in um, so we talked earlier about obviously the need for good role models and breaking stereotypes and supporting people uh, in the workplace um, so how do your organizations champion um, diversity and inclusivity for employees do you want me to go? On that? I don't mind. <laughs> so we've got lots of things that we do. Um, we work quite closely with lots of different um, initiatives. But but talking about role models, we have a few networks which we call advanced networks, and it's, they're basically mentoring schemes. So um, if you are part of any group, whether it is uh, gender or um, any kind of ethnic minority or um, part of the LGBTQT community, um, there is a network that you can tap into, um, and it's basically mentoring. So, um, you know, sort of one to one conversations about how to sort of uh, further yourself. Um, you know, I personally, as a as a female, I've I've um, sort of gone on a few courses with. Um, with people that I would view as role models. I'm not an engineer, I'm, I'm from a very different background, but it was still very relevant to the sort of role that I do, just to kind of um, listen to other people's experiences, some of the challenges that they faced and how they overcame them, um, and to kind of be introduced to various other people that can kind of sort of further you. So that's, that's one of the things that we do to challenge some of the um, experiences that people have, which are gonna be unfortunately prominent um, in, in the kind of engineering industry. Yeah, um, I'd add to that, I think quite a lot of the time it's about storytelling and finding those people that are working on those amazing projects and, and uh, encouraging them to tell their stories. We've heard from some of those people today. I think events like this are incredibly important. Um, but I think also in all of our organisations, we, we should be asking people what are they working on today and why is that exciting and interesting and then asking them to share that externally as well. Because in all of these huge organisations, some of the stories you've heard today about projects projects and work and the incredible things engineers can work on. Those are the things that happen every single working day in our organisations. And I think what we just need to make sure we're doing and what we, we actively encourage at WSP is for people to share their story about what they're working on and, and not just take off that project and move on to the next one because those stories, albeit they are the day job for a lot of people, are incredible and, and we need to share those far and wide and, and encourage students to come along to events like this where they can hear about them. 
Great. Cherie, do you want to add? Yeah, yeah, no problem. So I think um, within BP, diversity and inclusion is a huge agenda. Um, and there are multiple things that are in place to um, help not only uh, make people feel empowered to you know, speak up and being included within the, all of the conversations, but um, you know, similarly, there are a lot of, we call them, uh, you know, BRGs in terms of networks that are in place with different um, everything that you can imagine uh, from, you know, women in engineering to um, parents as well to help in terms of provide support and networks in place for, you know, that you can feel comfortable to go in and discuss any issues that there are. Um, even, you know, mental health, for example, is a different areas that you can go and talk to that. So there are a lot of these sort of like uh, network groups that are in place. Um, there's also uh, a lot of um, discussion around um, speak up culture. So that's something that is very heavily promoted, for example, within BP. Uh, everyone has the right to speak up and it runs through into the values and behaviors that the company holds. And if you go on the website, you will see this very prominently. Uh, so we have a lot of, um, we have, you know, different values and behaviors both and two of them are respect and courage. So courage to speak up if you see something wrong without fear of retaliation at all. And the second one is, you know, respect in terms of being respectful for each other as well. Those are things that we hold very dear to ourselves. Um, I think one small example that I would take or I can tell you about that is coming through at the beginning of the year is a uh, policy where um, bank holidays, for example, in the UK, you're now going to get flexibility on whether you take them or not. So you can book them off as a holiday or not. And that's to help in terms of the DNI agenda, because a lot of the holidays that we have now, you know, maybe you don't want to take off Easter, maybe you'd rather take it off the Eid, for example, or Diwali. So they're giving you flexibility in doing that. So that's just an example of how they've incorporated that into the actual corporate culture here. Thank you. That's a great idea. I think that's quite groundbreaking, actually. Hopefully uh, more companies will, will do that as well. Thank you. Um, so, for this event, people who register, they come from lots of different STEM backgrounds. Um, we've had a question come in from someone who is a non-engineering um, candidate, but they want to know what they can do to get into an engineering role from their degree. So, for example, they might be studying physics. Can I to answer that one? Yeah, you can. It's difficult to advise precisely without knowing what, what background they are from. Um, but within the built environment and careers in the built environment, there are a number of disciplines that, that take students from non-engineering backgrounds without the need for conversion. So for example, um, at WSP, we have uh, a large transport planning team. They would look at geographers, for example, and the skills that you would pick up in a geography degree. Um, that same team across transport also look at a number of modeling projects. So they would look at some of the data and physics type skills um, that you would need to, to look at some of the more complex transport modelling, pedestrian modelling type projects. Um, I think Lucy mentioned earlier project managers for example don't necessarily need to have that uh, direct engineering background in all parts of our business, certainly in some they do but, but not all parts. Um, we also have a huge environmental team, so those uh, studying sustainability type qualifications or more environmental related disciplines. So I think um, it really depends on the background. Uh, there are a number of opportunities across the built and natural environment that don't require an engineering degree specifically. Um, if it is somebody that wants to convert into engineering and, and become a chartered engineer, then there are lots of routes into the industry. Um, apprenticeships are certainly growing in our industry. There's a huge um, wealth of apprenticeships available now, including at degree level as well. So that's certainly a route that I'd, I'd encourage looking into as well if it was more of a, a plan to do a conversion. Cherie, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think uh looking into specifically different routes so if you're in physics for example and you'd like to get into an engineering course uh, and you're still at university just investigate ways to actually do that 
in terms of either um, adding module that if the optional modules, for example, that allows you to then take that route in or potentially even add an extra year if, if possible. So I would just say if you're still at the university level, um, go and have a discussion maybe with someone within the careers team or the advisors team uh, about options that are available to you at the university that you're going into. Um, and then also within the uh, employment sector, say you already graduated with a physics degree, uh, what you can do is uh, for BP, you can go on to our website and there's a career matcher um, table. So it has different degrees that you've got and it will let you know which ones, uh, which sort of areas within the company uh, or which roles you'll be able to apply to. So it's quite simple to use. You just find your degree and basically look down and it will let you know exactly what you'd be considered for. Um, I love that careers matcher as well. I used it <laughs> in preparation for this. Um, if anybody uh, is in the chat from BP, if you could pop a link into that, that'd be really helpful. Um, so, as I said, we've got people from all kinds of degree disciplines here. Um, I think we've got quite a lot of civil engineers as well. Um, so somebody is asking a question. Um, what do you think are the big challenges facing the civil engineering industry today? Mel, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I think you already heard from Claire this morning about the biggest challenge that, that we're looking at at the moment as WSP is the route to net zero. Um, and I think that that's, you know, we work with clients who are in industries that are not traditionally environmentally friendly and, and our challenge is working with those sectors and environments to continue the work that they're doing, but to do that in a more environmentally friendly way that supports the transition to net zero. So I think if I was to, to pick out one big challenge, and that's not just within civil engineering, that's, that's across all of engineering, that for me would be the, the one big challenge that I think... Um, our team certainly would, would put up there as, as being incredibly important for the future. Great. I mean, I, I would answer that by saying that we, if you're, if you're talking about the UK, we do live in quite a developed country. Yeah. Um, lots of stuff has been built. And um, I mean, I know that a lot of the projects that we work on, we're improving what already exists. So it depends on what your kind of passion is in terms of civil engineering. Um, but so far, I've not seen any downturn. I've been at Montmondon quite a long time. Our civil engineering vacancies are as high as ever. Um, we're kind of branching into all sorts of areas. Um, and I guess, I don't know, I mean, I guess it's just a way of working. Um, we're going very automated, very digital. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a, a like a bad thing if you're a civil engineering st engineering student. I think it just means you just have to kind of accept that throughout your career, things are going to keep changing and you've got to kind of keep up, whether it's sort of technology or the sorts of projects that you work on. Um, but yeah, so far, it hasn't seemed to have taken any kind of downturn from my experience. And also lots of smart buildings uh, planning as well and uh, reducing the carbon footprint through smart buildings. Mm. Yeah, and I think smart buildings is, is a, a huge topic at the moment because how we utilise the spaces that we all live and work in is changing mm -hmm. and the last 18 months has had a huge impact on that. And, you know, smart buildings technology can really influence how an office space works, how much space of that is needed to be utilised, how well that office space utilises things like energy and lighting and heating and ventilation and all of those sorts of things that are very different to where we would have been 18 months to two years ago where everybody was in the office five days a week doing the same sorts of activities. So even utilising technology to be able to flexibly book desks, for example, to be in the office on certain days, is that's a very basic use of smart tech and that's only going to get larger and larger in terms of how that will influence how we, we use the spaces that we use day in, day out. Georgia, I've got a question for you actually. Yes. Um, so in terms of, thank you on that, I, I could talk, not educated on smart buildings, but I'm very passionate about it and where, you know, where we're going to be living in, what kind of buildings and working in in the future is amazing, blows my mind. Um, we had a question in about what extracurriculars were part, did you partake in at university 
that you think set you apart from um, other people going for the role? And I know we heard from Milia earlier who mentioned, t t uh, tapped into that a little bit, but from your point of view? Yeah, so um, I was really into sports at university too, actually. Um, I played on both the women's and the mixed lacrosse team. Um, so that was a big part of my extracurricular and social life. Um, but I was also part of the systems engineering society and things like that. But I think that it kind of sets you apart, not necessarily because you played this specific sport or that one, but it really shows a company a bit more about your personality rather than just being a brain on a chair, maybe getting a first, that's great, but you're more than just that. And um, I think companies really like to see that. So whatever curriculars, extracurriculars you have, they're always good because they just show who you are. And from BP, do you look at specific extracurricular activities in applications as they're coming through? I think um, extracurricular activities can help, although I wouldn't be disheartened if you don't have any. For example, uh, when I applied, you know, eons ago <laughs> now, um, I didn't really do anything um, extracurricular. I'm horrible at sports. And um, I think the main thing that I was doing was uh, things like open days and, you know, working as a cashier in a shop, basically, in order to earn a little bit of pocket money to survive while I'm at uni. Um, but I think the key thing, really, that I did, even though I didn't really have a lot of extracurricular activities, was exhibit some of the things from those extra jobs that I was doing um, to bring, you know, some aspects of experience into the room when doing my interviews. So for example, um, collaborating or taking students around and showing them uh, all the different aspects of the uni or selling the uni to these students, basically, if this is where you want to be. It's one of these things where you need a bit of influencing skills there or uh, working in a shop, right? It can be quite uh, intensive at times. You're handling money. It's You have to make sure that, of, of course, you're not giving them too much back. Um, so little bits and pieces, I think, you can just utilize all of that within your application process. So don't be too disheartened if there's not, you, you know, you don't have a plethora of extracurriculars and you're just trying to get by because that's what happened to me. Um, you know, you can still kind of get into the company that way. Thank you. And I think there's a lot of pressure on students today to be always doing more and stand out from the crowd. In actual fact, being part of your STEM society at your university is, is a great start, actually. And I think talking with your peers on those courses can, can help give you ideas, but help you feel more part of a community. So it's not necessarily about having a paid work experience part. It is about being uh, on a society, maybe hosting an, a, a webinar on a society, um, anything I think really helps. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah absolutely. We, we've stopped asking about hobbies and things on application forms because I, I quite like reading those sections. I, <laughs> I, it, it's quite interesting sometimes things that you read, but I genuinely don't know how much hiring managers are using that bit to make a decision on who they're going to interview and sometimes it worries me they might use that bit mm -hmm. to decide who they're going to interview you don't want that bit of unconscious bias to creep in yeah. about what hobbies they might be doing maybe they support the same football team or something so I we've switched it now we ask um, what um, so here are some of the initiatives that you could get involved with at Mont McDonald sort of stem outreach or um, sustainability or EDI initiatives um, you know, have, is there anything that you do in your spare time or that you would like to do that you could bring and then and then continue that at, at Mott McDonald? I don't, I think, I'm sure we're all the same, but, you know, university doesn't finish and then all that stuff that you like doing stops and then you've got to start working. Hopefully, big organisations like the ones that we work for, you can continue all that sort of stuff and then you can, you, you know, and you should be given the time to do it as well. You know, your employer should give you a bit of time to do this sort of thing or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, not... I, I just, you know, I'm sure it's the same for other organisations. I don't think people worry too much about having these, 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 these big hobbies. It's more about what you're interested in and are you going to continue it you know, in your world of work. I think I'd add as well, it's not necessarily about what you've done. 
it's about how you can talk about it and recognise the skills that you've gained from it. So I'm, this is, I could, you sent, mentioned about smart buildings, I could talk about this all day. I went to a non-Russell group university, I lived at home and I worked three jobs whilst I was at university because I didn't come from a privileged background. So I couldn't go and join lots of societies, I couldn't go and do unpaid work experience, I couldn't really go and do paid work experience because I couldn't then keep up with my jobs. So I understand from personal experience that not everybody can do all of those things. But what I did do in those three, three part-time jobs was a call centre, bar work and reception work, all of which were customer service, which involved dealing with difficult customers, which involved me developing my professionalism and lots of other skills that I recognised along the way that I've taken into my work in life. So, um, and, and this was already mentioned about cash handling and so on. And I think it's not necessarily about what you do, it's about taking a step back from what you do, thinking about what you've learned from it and how that's transferable into your future career and then talking about that in your applications and in your examples so if you've done a role that involves working as part of a team for example which you might do in a shop or a, you could do that working as part of the crew at McDonald's you're working as a team together to make something happen and you think about what those skills are and how they apply in your application I think that's the most important thing to think about. Mm. Thank you my uh, university life was very similar to yours Mel. <laughs> Um, so, I'm going to start with Cherie with this one, because I think it's a cracking question. What would you tell your graduate self uh, going into the job that you're in now? What bit of advice would you give yourself? Um, one thing I would uh, tell myself is... Uh, try not to stress yourself out too much <laughs> in terms of the jobs that you've been given. I think once you, when you start in any job or, you know, have a new experience, um, you tend to want to uh, put your best foot forward. But at times that could induce a lot of anxiety and stress within yourself. Uh, and I think um, kind of there's, there's a couple of things I would, I would probably tell myself. A um you're going to learn a lot throughout your career it's not all about the technical sort of bookwormy aspect there's a lot of practical application within engineering and the experience that you're going to get is um you know it's going to be transferable into anything that you're going to do right um and also the experiences that you you will have in the future um there's such a wide range of different jobs that are available once you start going into different things. So I started in operations. So I worked in pet chems outside on a plant, uh, pretty much as a chemical engineer. Um, and now I, and then I moved into more of a corporate sort of role uh, within the headquarters of BP. Um, and then now I'm working in a planning and prioritization sort of role, which looks at sort of, um, planning and, and prioritizing different issues we have in order to resolve them. So each one of those roles, I've picked up a lot of skills along the way. Um, I, you know, early on in my career, I used to get really stressed out with thinking, I need to be 100% perfect at doing this. And I, and that's, you know, that's well and good. Um, but just try to uh, relax a bit and just really take in what's going on uh, because it, it can be quite an anxiety inducing um, early on in your career, I think. I agree, thank you. Uh, we focus too hard and we stop having fun yeah. along the way, don't we? And it yeah. stifles creativity, I think, which is really important in this job. Georgie, um, <laughs> what would you advise yourself only 18 months ago <laughs> when coming in? Well, one thing that I would say is when you when you get into a job, you, you do want to be able to do everything perfectly straight away, but no one expects you to be able to do that job perfectly. You're being hired as a graduate. They know that you've, you've been to university, you might not have had experience in, in the real working world, like a real engineering working world. Um, and if there's skills that you don't know, that's fine. They'll train you. You're not expected to know everything. So don't stress too much about maybe not knowing everything about one particular item that you've never seen before. It's fine. You'll, you'll learn it. You'll pick it up. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much. So, gosh, I've now got to be really selective when the question's coming in because we are um, running out of time. Sorry. Um, one actually for Mel and Lucy. So what advice would you offer um, for people during the application process? So actually, I love the fact that a lot of it's virtual now because um, massive imposter syndrome person here. And it just really relaxes me to know, mm. OK, well, you know, I, I've got to prepare myself before <laughs> on screen and so I think for a lot of people like me it, it already starts to help them relax a little bit but is there is there anything else that you'd offer in terms of the advice so for, the, for the actual interview process itself for the yeah yeah um, yeah I think I think you're right um, I think hope, what what personally what I don't think an interview is for is to see how someone copes under pressure I, I, I think what we really, really want is to see the best of this person. And if they're going to perform well at the interview in this horrible, even if it is a video, let's face it, they're never that fun. Then, then, then you know, this is you know, hopefully the person that we get on the first day is going to be even an improvement on that. Um, so you mentioned about imposter syndrome. Um, so I think if you're somebody that has perhaps, you know, worries, struggles with confidence, not particularly comfortable um, speaking. And actually, sometimes if, even if you feel like you are quite confident, when that video starts, anything could happen <laughs> if you don't have a lot of experience of it. And I know it's a really busy time, but if you do have some time, do just have some practice runs. Um, you know, I, I've, I've sort of interviewed Millie today. We were unprepared for that. So we had a quick few run throughs. I think if I just sprung those questions on her, she would have been sort of in a bit of a panic. So we just ran through it a few times to try and make it feel a bit more natural. So find a friend, maybe set up a mock team's interview together run through some questions you can't predict what's going to come up um, and get feedback from that person you know get them to be really honest with you years ago I used to do a bit of um, training on our IT system that we use and my manager overheard me and he said you say the word obviously all the time <laughs> and no one had ever told me that before and I've been doing this training for quite a long time but I didn't want to like patronize the person that I was speaking to so I say so obviously when you select that that's obviously going to take you to the next and I had no idea that I was doing it and hopefully <laughs> I don't do it anymore because I'm so aware of it um, but there might be little things that you do that you don't know you do so have a practice with you know with a friend ideally on video even if you want to sit in your room and just do it face to face but perhaps a real life setup is better and just get them to be really honest you, you don't know what weird things you do when you're under pressure <laughs> But that would be That's nice. a great tip. I <laughs> wish I'd have done that. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Has um, anybody else got anything to add? Yeah, I, I can add to that. Um, when I started training delivery, mine was okay. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> great. Okay. Um, I must say it about 20 times during the session. Okay, we'll move on now. So you're absolutely right. Everybody does have them. I know what mine was. Um, the thing that I would add to that is have a look, depending on who the employer is, at what advice and guidance they're giving you beforehand as well. Because usually recruiters, definitely, as Lucy said, we want you to succeed and do well and be able to present your best self. So one of the things that I know that we do at WSP is ahead of assessment centres that we're hosting virtually, the day or a, t a couple of days before, we'll set up two test teams sessions where you can click and join the link. We send those out as optional sessions. Um, and we have a real mixed uptake. Sometimes on assessment centres, we have lots of people join them. Fully appreciative that students have used Teams a lot through university now, so may feel completely confident and just not, not feel like that session's necessary. But we have had some people not join those sessions and then have issues with microphone, sound, etc. And that is just going to completely throw you off at the start of a virtual event if things aren't working because you'll panic, you'll focus on that and you'll lose the, the preparation that you've done for interviews and other sessions. So my advice would be definitely have a look for the guidance that's, that's there and if you are offered any of those test sessions or as, as Lucy said you can test with a friend then absolutely do that just because it takes away any risk or any possibility of stress before going into something that you're going to be assessed in. I like that that's a very 
human way to approach it from an employer's point of view and uh, hopefully that puts a lot of candidates at ease as well the fact that the employer's here saying here let's do a test first you mm. know so you feel good on the day I mean my biggest thing is it's okay to be nervous you should see me just before we get on stage everybody here saw me um and and that's fine it is about just being able to get your true self across um in that time uh, but yes nerves everybody has nerves um, we are out of time, obviously, so okay, we are now <laughs> okay. going to okay. <laughs> move into a break. Um, I'm so sorry for any questions that came in during that that we didn't get a chance to answer, but please, 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 all employers that are in that chat room, please answer them from, from your point of view. Thank you for joining us virtually, Cherie. I am so pleased that we didn't have any technical issues with this so thank you so much thank you to the rest of our panel as well we are going to head into a break um, another break and on the screen we'll see what's coming up uh, shortly as well um, there's going to be another woman uh, presented on screen, another trailblazer. So this is your second answer to anybody taking part in the society quiz to win 500 pounds, courtesy of Mott McDonald. Please take the note now um, and we will see you back here in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. 
what I'm talking about. Wait! Okay, now, from the beginning. Hit it, boys. Welcome back everybody. I hope you had a good break. You made a note of that engineer um, and you've got your email poised, ready to send to hello at campusmedia.co.uk with your name, the name of your STEM society and your three women trailblazing engineers. So you've had two so far. I'd like to welcome to the stage now Naomi Gil Gildert from Capgemini, who is an associate consultant in business technology. That's a mouthful, I've got all that done. Um, here we go. Hello. Um, thank you for having me today. Yep, I'm Naomi. I work at Capgemini Invent. I'm going to be spending the next five minutes whistle stop tour telling you about my company and um, my journey from electronic engineer to management consultant. And I'm going to get the clicker, which I forgot. Here we go. Um, okay, so. Uh, Capgemini Invent is the innovation, transformation and consulting arm of Capgemini. We have over a thousand employees in the UK and over 10,000 worldwide. And we are a technology management consulting company. Now, what is a management consultant? Uh, basically, businesses bring in management consultants when everything is on fire. Not literal fire, we're not fire engineers, but metaphorical fire. Uh, and we are brought in to solve problems that the business themselves can't solve. And that might be because they don't have the internal capability to be able to solve that problem. Maybe they don't know what the current technological solutions are for them to solve that problem. Or maybe just they can't really see the wood from the trees uh, because they're too busy being in the problem to know how to effectively solve it. So we come in, we analyze the problem, we solutionize and we help imp implement that with the business. Uh, in Capgemini, we do that across six different sectors, from the public sector to financial services. And we do it across our five capability units, looking at things from customer experience, to uh, analytics and AI, automation, to business technology like cloud and cyber security. The little hands here show the different entry routes that you can enter into Capgemini as a grad. So we have a lot of variety, we have a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, and it means that we can drive value to our clients, to their customers, and in the case of public sector, 
to the country. Uh, we have a 21-month um, graduate program called the Accelerate program, which I'm currently on, uh, which is divided up in three um, key stages that you can see on screen here to show it, to give you a chance to develop your core consulting skills, to get you client ready and working on client projects within three months of joining, and also in our academies, give the opportunity for you to gain accreditations and certifications to specialize in an area of your choice. I'm a big fan, I can definitely recommend it. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my journey now from electronic engineering to management consulting. So I started at university almost 10 years ago at the University of York studying electronic engineering. I've always had a passion for technology and innovation and the cutting edge, and that's what drew me to doing a PhD in robotics. But what I found when I was doing my PhD was I found that it was actually quite isolating working by myself, and I realized that I didn't actually get satisfaction from sitting at a computer and programming a solution. What I actually found satisfying and what I got value from was the things that I did outside of my PhD, like teaching and student radio, where I could collaborate with others to solve a problem and work towards a goal. Um, what I found when I kind of analyzed my passion in technology was it wasn't the satisfaction of physically creating the solution, it was how we can harness technology together to solve problems. I also found doing the same thing for four years very boring. Uh, I like a lot of variety in what I do. When I was doing my undergrad, I picked loads of different modules. Uh, I did lots of different extracurricular activities from radio to karate to being on the darts team. Uh, didn't last very long, but I tried it. Um, and I really wanted to bring that variety to the work that I did as well. So that led me to consulting and to Capgemini Invent. I joined in December last year, and you can see from my journey that I've already had a taste of that variety. Within 10 months of working here, I've worked in the public sector and financial services, and they're kind of the two most different sectors that you can get. Uh, I found working in Capgemini that my engineering background and my passion for technology has given me an understanding and an appreciation of how our solutions are developed and implemented. I've uh, found that my research background has helped me as a fast learner to quickly absorb new information and learn about new technologies. And I've found that my collaborative nature has enabled me to work effectively with the brilliant people in Capgemini Invent. I now find myself in an environment that is not isolating in any way at all, where I can work with new people and solve new problems every day and really see firsthand how technology can transform businesses. And I find that very satisfying. Uh, if anything that I've said today has resonated with you or you're interested in our Accelerate program, our applications are now open and I'll also be in the chat if you have any questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Naomi. That was really quick. And you also are a BBC radio presenter as well. Super cool. So, um, again, any questions for Naomi or Capgemini Invent, please pop them in the questions uh, in the chat and um, somebody will be able to answer them quickly for you as well. So we're moving swiftly on to our next Employer Insights session. Uh, with GSK and we are going to meet some of their graduates now and their placement engineers.
Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a process engineering placement student at Montrose. Um, so process engineering can vary quite a lot from site to site and role to role. So you might be more involved in like the design side. Um, but since Montrose is a it's a primary API manufacturing site, um, I'm more involved with kind of the day to day running of the plan um, troubleshooting or problem solving any problems that come up, um, but also working on improvements and new products that are being brought to the site. Um, so it's quite a good mix of kind of being in the office and also going out on plan, which is really great experience. Hi, I'm Phoebe. Um, I'm currently an FLP based at the WARE site in the automation engineering team. Um, so I primarily work on process control and automation. So that is um, configuration of what we have called the IP21 system. And that's a system that we use to essentially collect and trend all the data from all of our manufacturing lines. So I basically configure that system so that we are able to access and translate all the data that's being generated live on our production lines. Um, I also work in operational technology and cybersecurity. Um, so I'm currently doing a project now where we are migrating all of our shared passwords. So these are passwords that people like operators use to access equipment. Um, and we're currently migrating those onto basically like a cloud storage system, um, which sounds like quite a simple project, but these all have to be kind of calibrated and maintained. Um, and that needs to all be captured within the migration. Um, and it also covers things like training, uh, making sure that everyone knows how to use this new system. So yeah, automation is quite a wide range of things. And I think in addition to my role, like it can vary a lot from site to site. So it can be quite a bit more than just that as well. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sheree and I am an automation engineer on the FLP program. So at the minute, I'm coming to the end of my first rotation in Montrose. Um, Montrose is a roles that they're doing, um, where they are in, in that journey as well. So thank you very much for sharing that. And on the screen, there are, is further information about um, how you can find out more, what type of um, placement opportunities they have and graduate opportunities. And there are people in the virtual chat room from GSK as well. So there's a link on there about how to find out more. If we can get that on the chat as well, so people have that, that would be amazing. Uh, there's also a QR code as well, so you just might want to scan the QR code. So I'm going to be welcoming um, our next keynote speaker, Neera Kakadia, who is a project engineer at um, Transport for London. But she's also a finalist for the 2020 IET's Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award. And I just love this video. So I'm going to play this video and Nira's going to make her way to the screen. Growing up in a predominantly female household, I didn't know what an engineer was. It was only through research on the internet that I came across a video that showed me how engineers are impacting cities all around our world. Seeing the transport network connect millions of people around the country and how these shiny, great big skyscrapers were shaping our city, I knew I would become an engineer. I am now one of those people I saw in a video many years ago. Working for Transport for London now allows me to help build a greener, safer and more accessible city. TFL connects millions of people every single day. It is the beating heart of the city. There's something quite humbling working on large infrastructure projects. 
The scale of projects I work on are so big and although I may only impact a tiny part of the project, it feels like I'm contributing massively. Working on something small, like moving some cables, may seem insignificant at the time, but all these little design concepts, when brought together, is what really makes large infrastructure projects successful. Whether it's building a new station, a new line extension, upgrading some track, it's all to ensure passengers have safe journeys every single day. Whilst the engineering industry is still working towards gender parity, it is essential that we invest the time to paint the real picture of engineering. Engineering has had a facelift over the years. It's no longer about spending time in dirty conditions. It's not always about spending time doing complicated calculations. And it's a picture that we need to paint that it's no longer just a career for men. Young girls need the confidence and encouragement to pursue a career in engineering and I am 100% a part of this movement. If I didn't have strong female role models in my household growing up, I may not have had the confidence to study engineering at university and then go on to pursue a career in engineering. I want to be a role model to young girls and for them to understand that if it's possible for myself to have a successful career in STEM, it's also possible for them. I've only just started my professional career but for every barrier that I break down, I'm paving the way for more young female engineers who follow. Thank you, Amanda. I'm so grateful to be here today because it's events like these where you get to meet and hear from like-minded people that really kind of give you confidence and, you know, boost yourself up. And I myself have been very inspired today listening to the various people before me. So um, my name is Nira Kakadia, as you've just seen in the video. I am a chartered mechanical engineer and I work at Transport for London as a project engineer. So as a project engineer, I work in the major projects directorate, which means I basically work on large infrastructure projects. And my job is very varied. I do different things every day. I'm constantly learning. I have to you know, learn new things every single day. When I was asked to do the talk today, I kind of thought, you know, what would I want to hear about? Because you can read about what I do in my day job and you can hear it in the video. But what are the really interesting parts that have happened to me across the last decade? And what, how have they played a part in where I am today? So I'm going to focus on three main uh, topics that have happened or, or events that have happened, which I believe are career changing. So the very first thing that I think has really impacted why I'm actually an engineer was choosing my A-levels. So most people listening to this have already gone through that situation, but there is a lesson to take away from this. When I was choosing my A-levels, I really thought I was quite young to make such a big decision. How can three or four subjects that you choose dictate what you do at university and then your first job and then your next job? How can I you know, make that big decision at such a young age? And when I was growing up, I never really knew what career I wanted to do. I was never one of those people who, as a young girl said, you know, I wanna be a, an astronaut, I wanna be an optician. I was never one of those people. So for me, it was very difficult. I was scared, I was a bit nervous, I had no idea what was out there. And I didn't really have that much guidance in school. So I spoke to my parents about it, and my dad gave me some really, really good advice. He said, choose subjects which you're good at and what you enjoy. And I did exactly that. I took mathematics, ICT, and art. Now, traditionally, those subjects don't really go together. So if I was to tell you that I did studied those, you wouldn't really know what I do now. But what, I, what that did do is it enabled me to kind of look around and see what subjects these fit into. Between my three subjects, I had so many different skill sets. I had a very technical skill set from maths, ICT, I was very um, IT illiterate, and art and design really helped me be creative. So when I was researching, I did so much research. I watched loads of videos, I read a lot, I used Google. And I found a lot of stuff to do with architecture, civil engineering, mechanical engineering. And this was really the first time that I actually read the word engineer and understood what it meant to be an engineer. I was kind of lucky because I didn't know it was male dominated. I didn't know that very few women go into it. So maybe, you know, I was a bit ignorant in that fact. But it was great because it meant I took it for face value. It meant that I chose to study it at university. So I studied mechanical engineering. And I studied it because I read what it was. I went to the open days at university and I thought, yeah, that's 100% what I want to do. And luckily for me, that kind of gamble paid off because I can't now imagine doing anything other than what I do now. It's the perfect fit for me. 
So the, the, the lesson I would take away from this is follow your heart. If I had taken subjects to follow a, a, a certain career path, I might not be here today and I might ne not have found engineering as a career path. I think young people are lucky today because there is so much, uh, there's such a big spotlight on STEM and engineering and it's events like these that really will help you understand what we do and how you can get involved in it as well. The second career changing moment, which I kind of only realized probably a couple years ago, was during university, I decided to go traveling. Traveling for me at that time, I was 20, 20 years old, so that's a decade ago, was just fun. It was a bit of fun. I just wanted to you know, not be at university and just travel with my two best friends. But what I learned in traveling was some of the most important skills that I now have today. The first one was confidence. It was the first time that I'd been away from my parents and my sisters, and I had to kind of navigate three months of traveling by myself. I learned how to communicate. I had to speak to people who didn't understand English. I didn't understand their language. I had to use my body language, my hands. How do you communicate with people? I learned how to negotiate. I learned how to plan, budget, all of the things that I now use in my day job today as a project engineer. I have to plan projects. I have to budget for projects. I have to communicate with really technical people. I have to communicate with people that are also not technical. And what I hadn't appreciated at that time was traveling for me was a very personal thing. It was a selfish thing. But actually, it really helped me develop these skills, these soft skills that we kind of don't really talk about in engineering. The most important part, though, during uh, traveling was I met a young boy called Josh Mills. I met Josh. He was the same as me. He was young, traveling with his friends. Josh was a, it, it was a civil engineer. He was working at Transport for London, and he was on the civil engineering graduate scheme. And Josh was telling me about all the cool projects he was working on. And I remember there in Cambodia, sitting in a pub, and I thought, oh, wow, this guy has a really cool job. I think I could potentially do what he does. I study engineering, and maybe in a couple of years I could do that. So I wasn't ready, quite ready to get a job. I was, had two years to finish in my degree. But what I did do was I took down Josh's email address and number. And I kept in touch with him for the next two years. And really, this was my first uh, networking opportunity. I didn't know it at the time, but now I understand that to be very, very important. People will always say networking is so important. And for me, networking is about events like today, where I meet people in my industry. I meet people in the railway industry, the engineering industry. But this was the first time that I did networking in a personal um, arena. And it was the most useful thing I've ever done. Because when I got the interview for Transport for London's graduate scheme uh, seven years ago, I messaged Josh, I kept in touch with him, I messaged him, and he spent a lot of time with me over the, over the few weeks. He helped me with interview tips, what to do, what not to do, what to expect. And this was really the first time that somebody had actually given me tips on how to interview. And I think this is also something very important for people that are, you know, maybe going to interviews for universities or apprenticeships, graduate schemes, get these um, practice mock interviews in. They are invaluable. You know, the more you practice, the better you become. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, I, it's all about the technical stuff. You wouldn't have got the interview if you didn't have the qualifications. The next step is how do you put yourself across? How do you answer questions? It's all of these things. That, how are you a good communicator that kind of shape this? So if it wasn't my time going traveling, I genuinely don't believe I would have got the core skills about communicating, negotiating, planning, but also I kick-started my networking. And if it wasn't for Josh, uh, you know, I think he definitely played a big part in me getting a job at TfL, and well, I wouldn't, probably wouldn't be here today if I hadn't got a job at TfL. So my last kind of career-changing uh, lesson, I guess, was when I was graduating, I applied for loads and loads of graduate schemes, and I got about five interviews, and unfortunately, I was unsuccessful in every single one of those. And I was very scared. I thought, oh, am I going to be unemployed forever? Um, am I not going to be an engineer? Am I going to leave university and not know what I'm going to do? And I think I put a lot of pressure on myself because I wanted to jump straight out of graduation into a job. And I now realize that that wasn't the thing to do. Actually, it's important that you take some time out for yourself to figure out what you want to do. You know, maybe go see different things and then decide. I got an interview for TFL at the very, very last minute. Uh, so it was summer, and I was on what you call a reserve list. So TFL had given out all their places for the graduate scheme, and they had one last assessment center, which was what I was called in for. At first, I thought, wow, I'm lucky. How have I you know, managed to be on the reserve list? But then a part of me was like, am I not good enough? Because I wasn't one of the first people to get there. If I had held on to the latter thought, I probably wouldn't have done too well in my interview. 
I decided that this was my one last opportunity to get a good engineering role. And what I did was I messaged Josh. He gave me a lot of tips. But I also researched. I researched the company so much. I learned about what else TFL does. It wasn't just trains and buses. I learned what the business, how the business operates, and all these different things. And that's really how I think I had got the job at TFL. It was a very successful interview. And I made sure that my confidence was at the top of it. Because if I had let the fact that I was on a reserve list get me down, I genuinely don't believe I would have performed as well. And the takeaway from that point is there will be many setbacks in your education, in your career, and they will always come and go. But you have to remember to keep pushing. Only you can be in charge of your career path and your journey. And for me, I've had to do it multiple times. You know, you have to make sure you pick yourself up, dust yourself up, off and keep, keep going. So those were the three kind of big moments that I thought I wanted to share with you because I would have wanted to hear about that. And it was quite nice reflecting back on it as well. I'll summarize now just a couple tips or, or advice that I would have given to my younger self, which I would give to everybody. The first one is to be confident. Confidence is something that I think uh, you get more of as you know you go more more experience and you know the more you are further in your career. But it's something that I definitely think is important. You start to develop younger on. I was very shy when I was at university because I didn't know engineering was male dominated. I had a shock when I went to my first lecture and found out it was 90% guys. So for me, I had to re remember, you know, I am probably one of the only women here and I need to be confident. I need to answer the questions. If I know it, I need to raise my hand. The second bit of advice is ask questions. My job now, I don't know everything. And most of the times, most people don't know everything. And I ask so many questions. Sometimes people probably get annoyed with me with the amount of questions I ask. But the reason I ask questions is because a couple of times I've you know, finished a meeting, I've gone to a person and said, oh, what does NAWI stand for? And they said, oh, I don't know. And what I realized was if you don't know what something means, the chances are nobody else knows what it means either. And actually, I think people think that asking questions is a weakness, but I think it's a strength. The fact that you can actually confidently say, uh, I have a question, I don't know what that means, but the reason I'm asking is so I can find out and progress. And that is the one of the most important strengths I think women in engineering should definitely strive for. The third bit of advice is take risks. Uh, I've read kind of a lot of uh, books about, you know, how you should be and stuff, and it always talks about taking risks. What does that really mean? I think me, myself, you know, once you're very uh, content in your job or your role, and you're very, like, comfortable and you've got a routine, it's so easy just to, like, go in, go in your day each day, just do the same thing and same thing. But it's important to test yourself. It's important to try new things. Uh, just like I did a decade ago with traveling, I got, went out of my comfort zone. It's things like that that everybody needs to remember to keep doing. It's something that I need to remind myself, and I've reminded myself today, to take risks, keep doing different things. So I hope this has given you an insight into maybe not my journey, but definitely the little things that have happened across the way that have helped shape my career as an engineer. And for anyone that's you know thinking of getting into engineering, mechanical engineering, I would say do it. Stay curious, use the internet, there's so much out there right now. And if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to help anyone. Thank you so much for listening to me today. We do have some questions. Oh, okay. Now, actually, yeah. if that's okay, we yeah, can yeah. pull in. Oh, hi. hi, Nira. Thank you for, talk for that great talk. Um, there's a question in by email. Um, they, uh, someone asks, what are your top tips for networking? So I would say to go to loads of different types of events. So I now do uh, railway specific networking, which is all the different types of people in railway. So it's not just engineers, it's project managers, commercial managers. Um, and I also do a lot of stuff with the IMEC and IET. And that's very engineering heavy focused. So I would say use the internet, go, go to portals like the ICE, IET, IMEC. They've got like young panel um, members, they've got railway di divisions. There's so much stuff out there and there's so many like-minded people. Also use LinkedIn because it's so important. I think you're gonna hear from someone later which will tell you all about that. Brilliant advice. Um, I have another question. I really loved your presentation. Um, this is coming in from social media. How have you overcome feeling like a minority in the room, uh, in your role, or and have you ever felt unheard because you were a woman? Like, you are a woman. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, how have I overcome uh, being the minority in a room? I don't think I'm ever going to overcome that. I think every time, it's a bit better now because everything's virtual and you have to raise your hand on Teams, which gives everybody an equal you know, opportunity to speak. But in real life, when I do go into meetings, I do get very nervous still to this day. And I don't believe that's ever going to go away. But what I think does help is the fact that I am always very well pre prepared for my meetings. I make sure I, whatever the subject is on, I've read the documents. Um, so no one can ever catch me off guard. And also then I know what I'm talking about. I s tend to second guess myself sometimes. So it's important that if you do know the knowledge, which you obviously do know, um, you can you know, say it with confidence. And the second part was, have I ever felt like I have been unheard? At times, yes, I have. Um, they've never really impacted me that much. I think you just have to brush them off. Um, and at the end of the day, you are in your role for a specific reason. You wouldn't have been employed if you weren't good. So you just have to keep bringing that back to yourself. Powerful message, love it. Brilliant advice, thank you so much, Neera. Um, and again, if you've got questions for Nira, please pop them in the chat. If you've got questions regarding TFL as an employer as a whole, and um, Nira is unable to answer those, she will uh, direct you to our website address where you can find out more and connect with some of the employers there. So um, we have our final break coming up. So please stretch your legs. Um, have a bit of a, a lap around the room or wherever you are. Um, and again, we've got our third and final um, female that is going to, female engineer that is going to be um, on screen during the break. This is your final engineer for entering the competition. So this will be the third engineer that we are profiling. If you've got your email at the ready, you need to send that to hello at campusmedia.co.uk um, along with your name, your STEM society at university name and your three answers to the three trailblazing women engineers that have helped change the world. We'll see you back shortly.
from the beginning. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, hope you got that. I'm hoping to be getting lots of uh, competition entries in to my inbox very, very soon. Um, you've got until 5.30 to get your answers in on email. Um, and uh, we will be notifying the winner tomorrow. So once again, thank you very much to Mott McDonald for sponsoring the competition in celebration of Black History Month. And um, enriching your university society as well uh, from such a great prize fund. So you can see what we've got coming up. Um, I'm going to be welcoming to the stage now Laura Fox, who is a LinkedIn genius. <laughs> She's worked at LinkedIn for uh, many years and she is returning. I'm really thrilled to see her returning to Women in Engineering again this year. Last year she did um, some great talks uh, for us in terms of building a winning profile and networking virtually. And so we're gonna be in the chat now, popping a link to a page where you can find those uh, pre-records from last year because they're well worth a watch. Um, I always take so many notes during Laura's sessions because I learn so much. And um, yeah, the, there's still opportunity to learn more. So welcome, Laura. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, the team. Um, yeah, I'm so delighted to, to be back again this year. And as usual, I am overflowing with stuff that I could talk about in relation to LinkedIn. And I have this whole session planned, of course, um, and we're going to be focusing on content uh, this time, because as Amanda just said, last year we talked about profile and networking, and I will just touch back a little bit on what we talked about because I do think it's a good opportunity just to set the stage around content by talking about those two areas first. Um, just before I jump in, I just want to reference Neera's presentation, which I thought was absolutely brilliant and you were so natural and just so full of confidence, which I thought was amazing. But you said a couple of things that um, I just want to you know, re refer to. You talked about um, skills and how when you were going for interviews employers often you know you've got the skills because you've got through the door but um, 
it's really important to communicate what you're all about. And I think that's so important from a LinkedIn perspective as well. So just to kind of follow on from there, you know, recruiters can offer, for my 20 years of working with recruiters, often they will find it is not that difficult to necessarily find the skills to do the job, but finding the cultural fit is really what they're, you know, looking for. And LinkedIn is a brilliant place to really put your personality into your profile. So um, couldn't agree uh, more with that. And obviously just a quick nod as well there's been loads of updates onto the platform and I'm not going to spend um, time today talking about the job section but as Neera referenced in her presentation it's really important to practice interview skills and LinkedIn has introduced a very handy tool to do that um, so if you go on linkedin.com to the job section across the top navigation there is actually a place called interview assessments I think it's called and you can actually record yourself practicing interview questions and they have preloaded into the system now loads of interview questions typical questions that you might get asked so if you want to have a practice at home on your laptop um, before going to an interview LinkedIn can help you now with that as well so I just before I jump in I wanted to share those things while they were top of mind so I just put this up here so you can um, find me if you want to as well. I will always try and help and answer any specific questions that you've got. Um, please feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. I share loads of stuff about LinkedIn because obviously content is very important, which is what we're going to talk about um, here today. So yes, I work uh, spending a lot of time coaching companies um, and individuals around how to use LinkedIn. So what I'm gonna cover in the next 30 minutes are these three things. The first one is just a quick recap on what we talked about last year, just to set the scene. Um, and for those who haven't seen those sessions, it's okay, I don't mind, um, why, why content is important in the broader context of the LinkedIn platform. The second thing I'm gonna talk about is um, you can't see the session, there you go, you can't even see the slide, um, is how you position yourself as an expert through content and trying to demystify some of the things that people think that they should write about and you know, thought leadership and some of these ideas that kind of tends to put people off posting. So I'm going to try and make it super simple to know what to post, when to post, how to post, and then the practicalities of that. What time? You know, if you're only going to post once a week, is there a better time than others? Should I use hashtags? What are the importance of hashtags? All those more kind of practical things um, to give you the confidence to um, jump in and, and start with content. So let's set the scene a little bit first. So this is my quick three-step approach into how to go about using LinkedIn as a platform for your personal and professional brand. So one of the primary reasons that people come to LinkedIn is to have a place online where they can house their professional profile of record. If someone wants to check me out professionally, they can find me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is very highly referenced on Google. You know, as, a, as a somebody that owns my own company, I couldn't pay the amount of money that Google would require to put my company and me on the first page of the, LinkedIn, of, of the Google search results, but my LinkedIn profile gets me there. So it's really well search indexed. And the number one activity on LinkedIn, and I think I asked the audience this last year, the number one activity on LinkedIn is still to this day and has been looking at other people's profiles. So that is why people come. So therefore, if you do nothing else on LinkedIn, just have a really robust profile that tells your professional story because people are gonna look at you regardless of whether you want them to or not. You've got this handy little dashboard on your profile that tells you how many visits you're getting. And I can assure you that number is never zero. So have a really good profile. So that's the starting point, And that's why we went into detail on that last year. Okay, so you've got a great profile and what do you do next? So having a strong network is really, really important. For again, referencing what Neera said in her presentation just now, networking is really key to having a successful professional career. And, you know, I've been working for nearly 20 years now. I can't possibly remember 
all the people that I've worked with in my, in my previous companies or know what they're doing today, but LinkedIn does. So it's a great way to keep in touch with people. It's a great way to unearth opportunities. It's a great way to learn from other people. Um, and so basically the, the short story here is add people to your network on an ongoing basis. Make sure that you're connected to all the people that you know in real life people from your course, people from any internships you've done or any jobs that you have, your, um, your tutors, family, friends, people in your community, basically people where you can see there might be some value in being connected either now or in the future. So that's kind of the networking piece. That's the second kind of reason that people come to LinkedIn. And the third big reason why people come to LinkedIn is to learn. So LinkedIn has become the largest online platform professional news in the world. And so people come to LinkedIn to learn how to be better at the jobs that they do, to keep up to date with industry trends and insights, and basically to go to meetings and, and, and look smart. That's what I always used to say. So it's a great way to um, raise your head above the parapet. If you do nothing else on LinkedIn, have a great profile. But if actually you want to be more proactive with your approach to LinkedIn and you want people to see you and you want to influence other people and you want to note them to notice you, whether you're in a role that you love doing, whether you're looking for a, your, your next job opportunity, content is a great way to be seen. And so that's why we're going to be talking about that predominantly today. So that's my three-step process. Have a great profile, keep adding people to your network and start being proactive with content. So that's the setup piece. Now we're going to go on to kind of the meat on the bones of our presentation and how do you actually optimize your presence? How do you actually position yourself as an expert? When I started thinking about content, I always used to think about thought leadership. Like that was a term that always used to kind of cloud my kind of thinking. It's like, well, I'm not a thought leader. You know, I'm not one of these people that, you know, can people are gonna look at my content and I'm gonna be teaching people. And I, and I do a lot of sessions around content where people go, well, that's not me either. And what should I write? And I'm not really sure. And um, actually, I kind of wanna put all of that to bed. You know, I looked up um, what the term, like where did that term even come from? Um, and it was, it was coined by um, the editor in chief of a strategy and business magazine in the early 90s, who talked about it being, you know, you're a thought leader if you're recognized by your peers as somebody who deeply understands the business that they're in, has distinctively original ideas um, and kind of influences trends. Okay, so that might be right for some of us, but the least I think that we, all of us here on this call and a lot, all the people in this room can do is we can have an opinion. And I think when it comes to content, all we need to do is to share what your opinion is on a particular subject that's in your field. So I don't think we need to pressurize ourselves that we have to do something that's got some great meaning. And also I think that people become very bogged down in thinking I have to write original content all of the time. You don't. There is a definite place for curating content that's already out there. There is so much information out there on the web. You know, we are reading articles all the time on the BBC, in The Guardian, in Trade Press, on the IET's website. We're, we're surrounded by content all of the time. And it's absolutely okay to share content and add a comment to a post that you might be um, thinking of writing. So I suppose that what I'm trying to say here is that content is for everyone. It, you don't have to, you know, weigh yourself down with thinking that it needs to be something that's, you know, worthy of a, of a university degree. Um, LinkedIn is now investing heavily in giving people more tools to create content. So they have this thing, you may have seen it called creator mode. Um, at the moment, it doesn't do too much, but there's lots of plans um, that's coming down the pipe to help people make great content. They've set up this thing called the creator fund, which you can apply for if you're really someone that's heavy into making content, where they'll actually kind of give you a bit of money to help you do that. And the platform has changed so much um, during COVID. So actually, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. So pre-COVID, and I think COVID has changed the platform a lot, 
Um, people were predominantly coming to LinkedIn to get advice from peers, get recommendations, and to learn. And you know, there's been loads of studies about what type of content people are coming from. There's been a study after study, leadership impact study, and, and saying that people want this amount of uh, great content a week, etc., one hour and three hours. And I think one of the biggest conversations I have with people is, is LinkedIn becoming a bit more like Facebook? And what we're seeing in terms of a trend on LinkedIn is that content is becoming much more personal, much more authentic. It doesn't need to be highly polished if it's video. You can take a video of yourself walking down the street and talking about a conference you've been to, just like this one that you've attended online maybe. And I think that the style of content is shifting and that's probably because um, the line between work and home is fused a little bit more because people are working from home so there's more of a, a blend between the, the way that people are working and people are being much more open about what their working life is like you know I posted something yesterday about coming here and how excited I was to be here because I haven't got the dog barking and I haven't got the builders banging and I haven't got all the interruptions that I have in my normal working day and it was one of my best performing posts so it was still professional and people still want those professional interests, but they people, I think, want to know a lot more about the individual behind the post. I think perhaps more now than 18 months ago. One of the things I would have said if I'd given this presentation a year ago is that from an algorithm point of view, and let's not forget that LinkedIn is a site that's driven by algorithms, that timeliness and brevity were two of the most important aspects when people were looking at content. They want relevant content that's easy to digest. So not very long and really relevant. You know, there's no point posting something about, uh, uh, let's talk about a building that's being built or a big change in your sector that's a week old. Timeliness and brevity were two of the important, most important things. LinkedIn actually changed their algorithm about a year ago. And obviously with the addition of COVID as well, I'd say that probably two of the most important aspects when it comes to how well your, your content may perform on LinkedIn is consistency and quality. So I was having this conversation earlier with somebody um, in, the, in the green room backstage and we were talking about how important it is to be consistent on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn wants you to show up it wants you to come and share content. It wants you to engage in conversations on the platform and the algorithm will reward you for that. So I go to meetings all the time and people go, okay, I'm gonna write a great post once a month. No, you need to be showing up multiple times a week, posting once a week, commenting, engaging. Um, consistency is really important in getting the reach of your posts out there and you will be rewarded for that and quality of course there's no point putting posts out every day if no one's reading them so i would say and i'll come on to this later in my presentation in terms of frequency write one really good post a week share one really good article once a week Sh write a couple of really thoughtful comments on someone else's post once a week that's all you need to do and all those micro behaviors that the algorithm is looking at, like are people opening your posts? Are they clicking on your links? Are they expanding them beyond the first sentence? Um, all those things are giving your content a score as to whether or not it's any good. So don't just put stuff out there. Don't just go down the consistency. Oh, I need to be out there all the time. Actually be more thoughtful. And I'll come on to in a little bit, what does good look like? So I hope you can see this. So what does remain true today and say a year and a half ago is that no one cares about you. People don't wake up in the morning and look on LinkedIn and go, oh, I wonder what Laura Fox is thinking about today. They think everyone thinks about our own problems. So we, we, we're trying every day to solve our own problems or our clients' problems or the projects that we're working on. They're certainly not coming on here to think about what I'm doing in my daily life. So what does remain true is that great content lives at the intersection of these three things. What does your audience need? 
and how are you best placed with your experience to help them solve it and what's your perspective? So when you're thinking about, well, what am I going to post about? Think about what your own goals are but then turn it on its head and think about what does someone else need to see. So if you're coming onto LinkedIn because you're looking for a job, your goal is that you're looking for a job. But actually, the audience that you're trying to influence might be recruiters in the engineering companies that you're trying to go after. So therefore, you need to be thinking about what do I need to be posting about? What are the keywords that my profile has to show? What are the hashtags that need to be on my profile so I'm coming up in searches, that I'm appearing on the right people's news feeds? So it's turning it on its head and thinking about actually what does someone else need? And then it's thinking, well, how am I, with my unique perspective, with my skills and experience, going to help them with this this problem and it might not be hiring it might be actually you're already working for a company and you want to be seen internally you want to be recognized you want to progress you want to you're going to go for a promotion you want to move to a different team and you want the hiring manager of that team or that other department so connect with those people start posting about different things that you think they might be interested in because ultimately when I think about LinkedIn really it's an ice-breaking platform It's a platform that allows you to influence other people and just start to chip away at their awareness of who you are and what you're all about. And really, that's what moulding your personal brand is. And I'm going to come on... Actually, let me do it right now. When it comes to... So those are kind of... So projecting what other people need is really the most important thing. So where do you even start with that? There's so many different ways that you can approach this. And I don't know if you can see this slide because actually the writing is a little bit small. But you can either take, there's different stances that you can take. You can go, okay, I'm going to be the industry person. I know everything about what's happening in my space. I read all the trade press. I know everything that's happening within the sector. And I know all about these different things that are happening. Or you might be really uh, product focused. I'm going to be the specialist in my business and all these new things that we're launching. Or I'm going to be... let me take the example of Shruk Elatar, who I met this time last year. You know, Shruk's profile just screams of enthusiasm for the engineering sector and women in engineering, and that's her bag. So I suppose what you need to do is think, what kind of person do I want to be? Do I want to be a specialist in my field? Do I want to be someone that inspires others? Do I want to be somebody that teaches others? And then my advice would be, Think of two, maybe three subjects that you're going to post on consistently. Because people, are, you have a very small window where you get to influence people, where you come up on someone's news feed, where someone sees your name, where someone sees your message, or maybe you've commented on, you know, put a, a thoughtful message on someone else's post or a comment. You've got a very small window of opportunity to influence somebody else. So what do you want to be known for? And if you are posting on too broad a range of subjects, then it's going to be very hard to try and influence people's perception of your personal brand. So if I take myself as the example, my topics are that I, you will only ever see me post on on LinkedIn. One, LinkedIn, obviously. Um, and not just LinkedIn, because there are lots of other LinkedIn consultants in the world. I always try to make it clear that I worked at LinkedIn for many years, so I've seen under the hood. So it's LinkedIn and kind of my close association with it then and still now. My second subject is B2B marketing, because I help companies, large and small, with marketing themselves, their product, their employer brand on LinkedIn. So those are my two main subjects. And then like a tertiary subject, a third subject, which I don't post on as much, is leadership. Because I have a personal interest in leadership. I work with a charity uh, that's a leadership development charity. But that's kind of slightly less. So it's probably 40, 40, 20, or maybe, you know, even more on the first two. So those are my three subjects. I have a broader range of interests beyond those things, three things in my professional life. But those are things that I want to be known for. And when I think about what my goal is for using LinkedIn and who I'm trying to influence and why I'm here, 
is because I want to be known as a LinkedIn expert. I want to win business. I want to be able to come to events like this and teach and talk about LinkedIn. Um, and so that's what I stick to. So as, as a bit of homework, if you, if you like, go away after this session and think, what do I want to be known for? What are my two subjects? Maximum three. And start thinking about, okay, what am I going to post about every week? And I even come up with a little plan for yourself. Like every week I'm going to post, I'm going to take an article from here and write a comment on it. So that's where I would start on your road down content. Okay, some of the practicalities. I love all this. People get asked me questions all the time about what should I post and when and what time? So um, let's have a start to break that down a little bit. So I've already talked about content creation versus content curation. So there are lots of different ways that you can engage on the platform. Curation, as I said, is take an article that's already out there, share it on a, in a post, write a comment. Don't just post it blind, which you do see people doing, but really we want to know what your point of view is. Going back to that point about thought leadership, don't worry about that. What's your point of view? Why are you sharing this? Why is this interesting to your audience? So curating stuff that's out there on the web, great. Um, if you want to write your own post, maybe you've got a blog, maybe you want to share something, that's also obviously absolutely great. I actually find it easier to do that. I might write a post about giving this presentation today with a picture, um, but there's lots of ways that you can engage. You can like or do one of the reactions because there's more than just like now, there's support and love and all of these different um, ways that you can engage. Um, you can comment, which I've already mentioned, very scores very highly on the algorithm. So commenting is really good on LinkedIn. Um, and also be a good LinkedIn citizen. You know, why are people posting on LinkedIn? Because they want people to comment. They want people to engage in a conversation. That's why I post, that's why they post. So do it and especially if you're trying to get on the radar of somebody, put a comment on their post because they'll see it. And again, first thing they'll do, look at your profile, which is why your profile needs to be really strong. And obviously there's other things. There's long form articles that you can write, like a blog. If you like podcasts and you create podcasts, you can put that on LinkedIn. Video, obviously massively important these days. I mean, I read a statistic that said that by this time next year, 80% of content on the web is going to be video. So, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute because we have to all get comfortable with video. Even if like me, you hate the way you look on video, we need to start doing it. Um, and you can share uh, uh, content as well, like decks, PDFs, PowerPoints. And actually they, from an engagement point of view, they do really well. The only thing as a quick tip that I would avoid is the dreaded share button. Don't press the share button. You can do, I do sometimes, but if you're only gonna post once a week, don't let it be a share. Because actually LinkedIn rewards new content more than it does share content. So if you're only gonna post once a week, you may as well, like even if you've seen something else that someone else has done and you like the idea of sharing it, copy and paste what they've written and attribute it back to them. So um, that's just a, a quick side note. In terms of actually what makes a good post, a really strong opening line. So you've probably seen on your LinkedIn newsfeed, you get about the first sentence or two, and then you have to um, press to see more. So LinkedIn's algorithm is looking at how many people um, are doing that. And oh, we just want to hook people in. So a really strong first line on any post that you put out is really, really important. Um, use an image. So never post just text. So, um, I mean, if you're sharing a link to an article that exists elsewhere, it will automatically bring in the image anyway. But if you're gonna write your own thing, find an image that goes along with the article because there's loads of data to say that those posts do better than ones without images. Um, mention, so at mention people. I always think that in work, we never do anything alone, we collaborate. Um, and it's always great to expand the reach of your post to get out to more people if you bring others into it. So, for example, if I'm here today and I'm going to say, oh, I was at Campus Media's event and I absolutely loved it, but I don't mention anyone else that's here, the reach of my post is going to be my connection network. But if I mention Neera and Amanda and some of the other amazing people that I've met backstage who've presented to you today, 
they will get notified and we know again from the data they're much more likely to engage so instead of just my connection network seeing the post then it has the ability to go out to all of theirs as well and suddenly I'm amplifying the reach and the potential reach of my post so always try to at mention um, and it will create a hyperlink to someone else's profile hashtags always use hashtags um, it says on the slide three to four actually you can have up to nine according to the data works is, is optimum um, but it's not like Instagram where you might have 20 so um, hashtags are a great way to signpost people to your content. So I follow hashtags. Did you know that? You can follow hashtags. So I might follow hashtag LinkedIn, hashtag marketing, hashtag recruitment. And anybody who posts on um, with those hashtags come up in my newsfeed because it, I'm basically signposting to LinkedIn that I like that content. So use relevant hashtags um, in your post as well. And Almost going back to that point, I said, is LinkedIn becoming a bit like Facebook? I think one of the ways that perhaps you could liken it to that or to Instagram or, or TikTok or whatever is that the tone is very conversational. Now, that's not to say don't be professional. Absolutely. You should conduct yourself on LinkedIn exactly the same way that you would do in an office environment. But I think it's absolutely fine to be yourself. You can be professional and approachable and you can be real. So think about, it's more important to think about your intention and what you're trying to say than getting worried in and, and caught up in kind of corporate speak. So from a tonal perspective, being conversational is great. And just as a side note, I would avoid any negativity. Um, you know, LinkedIn is a positive platform. And again, you know, nobody likes a negative Nancy. So, you know, don't be that person that's in the office having a moan about this and have you seen that? And, um, you know, try and always retain a kind of a, a positive tone to, to what you're saying. Now, if you're only going to post once a week, you might as well pick a time where LinkedIn has the highest levels of traffic because you're going to maximize the number of people that are going to see your post. So this data is courtesy of Sprout Social, um, who are updating regularly. And actually, I mean, I've seen shifts in this data, you know, from this three months to three months before. It does change. Um, but anywhere where you can see dark blue on my slide, so um, those are good times to post. So, for example, Wednesday from 8 to 10 in the morning and at noon, uh, Thursday, 9, 9 o'clock. Basically, in brief, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, morning and lunchtime is pretty good. Anything after Friday morning, forget it. And if you think about the, work, the way that we work, you know, people come, I tend to avoid a Monday. Um, people are coming to work, they're getting themselves set up for the week. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, going on LinkedIn is their top priority. Um, so perhaps this traffic is slightly lower. And we're talking about in terms of millions of views here so it's relative but um, stick with Tuesday Wednesday Thursday mornings and lunch times I think would be kind of your your best times to do that and then I did just make a mention and we're almost at the end here video so if you recognize this person uh, 10 points for you this is Goldie Chan she is a top LinkedIn video creator and a LinkedIn top voice um, LinkedIn top voice, Google that by the way, they make a list of who creates great content and they slice it and dice it by country and sector. So if you want to see people that are doing it really well, have a look at that. But Goldie Chan is the queen of video content. I mean, she has shared 500 daily consecutive videos, generating over 4 million views. And she has a LinkedIn learning course, the learning portal on LinkedIn about how to create great content and personal brand. And She's just, she's absolutely brilliant. So if you want to create a great video, there's just a couple of top tips that she's shared. She said, challenge yourself to make great content, even just when you start every single day, because you'll learn so much along the way. I think that's a great tip. She says, engage directly with your audience, which is sort of what I said um, earlier. So be very, think about who it actually, why you're on LinkedIn and who it is you want to influence and make content for them. Goldie has green hair. Um, it's okay to be different. And she talks about getting comfortable with your difference. I know myself, I sometimes get worried about how I come across. 
I find my voice is very high when I listen to it back and sometimes I'm mindful that I should drop it down a little bit. But she talks about just getting comfortable with your difference because that's absolutely fine and it doesn't matter the way you look or the way you sound, it's more about what you say. Um, and finally, one of her top tips is about having that consistency, having the discipline and being you know, comfortable with imperfection. Don't worry if something isn't perfectly polished. In today's world, that's absolutely fine. Um, but if you, if you Google Goldie Chan or find her on LinkedIn, you'll find loads more great tips from her. Um, I'm gonna skip over that. Quick note, I mentioned this already, great content. Look at link, Google LinkedIn top voices and you will find tons of people who are doing this really, really well. And they've actually just released a list of early career professionals. So people who are kind of starting out in their career who are producing great content. So I think that's definitely worth a look. And just to close out my piece, um, if you, I think you're gonna get to see a copy of my slides, but I've also just included a list on here of some other really great assets um, that you can look for. There's a really good new course, well, it was this year, March, I think, for LinkedIn for students. So you can have a look at that and there's some great tips in there. Um, I also saw an interview last week with LinkedIn's new-ish CEO, Ryan Roslansky, and he, he has done um, his advice for new graduates. And it's a really, really great read. So um, have a look at that. And there's also a channel of content called Getting Hired, which is another LinkedIn created channel for you know, young people looking to get hired. So I thought I'd put all of this in there as well. Um, so thank you. I hope that was helpful. Um, please do follow me on LinkedIn, reach out um, through the various chat channels and ask if you've got any questions. And at this point, I'm going to hand back to Amanda. So helpful. I've made uh, a few bullet points there for myself. Um, annoyingly, I did a share just before Laura Vention, don't share. So noted to self, stop sharing. Um, thank you so much, Laura. Yes, all of the content will be available on demand after the event. Everybody who's registered to receive your link today will also have had an opt-in to receive further information from the event, from the employers. If you haven't registered, in the chat now, there will be a link to the Typeform registration page if you want to receive information from the employers and hear from them and have their slides and, and see the on-demand link as well. Um, Laura, there were two brilliant questions that came in on email, and I'm so sorry we can't address them live, but if you can um, answer those in the chat, that would be amazing, please. Thank you so much. Um, any more questions? Laura's in the chat now. Um, so we're, we're moving on to our penultimate insight session now, um, and this is for BP. And we're joined by uh, Natalie Cowling, who's our careers advisor, and um, two uh, candidates who have been through the, the graduate um, scheme and placement scheme. So, and BP are also in the chat room as well to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, so welcome to um, BP's Insight Session at the Women in Engineering event today. Um, so today uh, with BP, we have myself, Natalie Cowling. I'm an early careers advisor at BP, and I recruit engineering, summer interns and graduates, and I also host the Female Discovery Week at BP. Amina, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Amina. I'm a second year instrumental control engineering graduate at BP. So I have a background in electrical engineering, which I did for my bachelor's. And I did my master's in advanced control and systems engineering and joined BP September 2020. So I've been at BP for slightly over a year now. Thanks. And Natalie? Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Natalie Gilchrist and I'm also a second year graduate. So I joined as a grad in January, 2020. Um, so I studied mechanical engineering at university and then joined and my first rotation was um, as a subsea hardware engineer. 
And then more recently, I've been working as an electric vehicle charging project engineer. Perfect. Thank you both. OK, so we are going to talk a little bit now about BP, um, what the opportunities we have within engineering um, and our application process. Um, so I'll start firstly with BP's purpose. So in 2020, our CEO Bernard Looney announced that BP had a new purpose, and that was to reimagine energy for people and our planet. So our ambition is to become a net zero company by 2050 or sooner and to help the world get to net zero too. And despite COVID-19, um, we are more committed than ever in the direction that was set out to us last year. So early careers opportunities at BP. Um, so we offer a range of um, sort of programs across different years. So we have um, some early engagement programs, which are insight weeks, discovery days and shadow days. Um, they are for first and second year students, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. We also have penultimate year um, opportunities, and they are summer internships in engineering, science, business, digital, and trading. We also have one year placements in trading and shipping. And for graduates in final year, um, we have uh, graduate schemes in engineering, science, business, digital, and trading. So for our insight weeks, I just um, just discussed there on the early engagement programs. Um, these are a chance for students to learn new skills, network, shadow, and you also get a fast track opportunity um, when it's time for an application for an internship program. These are all paid weeks, and we have the female discovery week, the widening participation program, and the digital discovery week. So these are open to first year on a three year course or second year on a four year course. And to apply to those, you just need to visit our website. But they're all designed to give you an insight um, into different business areas within BP. Um, and obviously you get fast track at the end of it. So for intern internship and graduate opportunities in engineering, um, typically we open for um, civil engineering chemical process engineering, instrument control and electrical, marine engineering, mechanical engineering, petroleum reservoir engineering, project controls and wells. So the application process. Um, so as you can see, the application process there is sort of a, a six tier process. Um, as I talk through this, um, you'll see there at the top, there are some arrows. So Discovery Week candidates will go up to higher view and at that point um, selected into the programmes. And that's obviously because you are offered a fast track at the end of the programme to go to technical interview when you do come to apply uh, for an internship. Summer interns, their final stage will be technical interview. Um, so if you make it through to the technical interview and you are successful, you'll be offered a role after technical interview. Um, graduate applicants will go all the way through, um, so the final stage for graduates is the Exploration Day or Assessment Centre, and if you're successful after that, then you'll be offered a graduate place. Um, so all throughout the process, BP's values and behaviours um, shine through each of the stages. Um, so to start with, um, you will visit our candidate matching tool, um, enter your degree, and what year of study you're in, and that will bring up all the roles that you are eligible to apply to. Um, you can only make one application per year, so do have a look at the job descriptions and decide which one you want to apply to. After that, you'll be taken through to the situational judgment quest questionnaire. Um, so it's an online test, there is no time limit, uh, but this is basically testing you in alignment with BP's values, so have a good look at those before you take the test. You will then be invited on to psychometric tests, uh, which are numerical and verbal. Um, and our advice here would be to do some practice tests ahead of doing the real thing. This is a time test, um, so it's always good to do the practice tests ahead of. Um, so you're coming in knowing what to expect uh, when you do the test. If you're successful after that stage, um, it's the global on-demand video interview. Um, and this is 
a blend of sort of motivation and competency based questions. So again, really have a think about why you want to work for BP, why the discipline you've chosen, and then have, have a look at the values and behaviours um, and, and think about those for your on demand. This is the final stage for BP Discovery Week applicants. After that, for interns and grads, it's technical interview. This is where your technical capabilities um, are assessed in line with the discipline that you've applied to. Interns, um, like I said, will finish here um, and hopefully receive an offer. Graduates will then continue on to the exploration day, which is a bespoke exploration day um, to test, again, alignment with BP's values and behaviours. Um, so again, do have a look at those ahead of the day. Um, just a quick snapshot there of our values and behaviour, and you can look at these in more detail online, um, but they really are sort of the core of everything that we do, um, and everyone within BP works in line with the values and behaviours, which are safety, respect, excellence, courage, and one team. So I'm going to ask um, my lovely graduates, Natalie and Amelia, to come off mute. Um, and we are just going to do a little bit of a Q&A for you, um, just so you can hear from, from some graduates at BP. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, what you most enjoy working, you know, what you most enjoy about working at BP. So Amelia, if we start with you. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Natalie. So um, for what I in, for what I enjoy, like um, working working at BP, I'm going to touch on just three things, but there are a lot more, obviously. But I'm going to talk on like three things that immediately come to mind. So obviously, the first one is the amount of training and support available. Like coming into BP, I knew that I was going to be I was going to I was going to get a lot of support, but being in the process as as literally like blown had me mind blown. So like people are really willing to help. There's internal and external training available to like help you succeed in your career. So there's literally like no excuse to slack. There's also the breadth of opportunities available in BP. That's also one thing I really enjoy about working at BP. So I'm just going to, I'm going to give an example. So for instance, I currently work on a gas project um, based in Mauritania and Senegal. And I have this colleague who works on it as well. But for his next rotation, he's going to move in into like electric vehicle charging. And I think that's that's really interesting because he's like moving from a, a gas project, a traditional gas project, to something different, something very interesting. So the fact that I know that there like there's the breadth of opportunities and depth of opportunities available at BP is something that like inspires me every day to keep working and to keep showing up at work. And perhaps like the biggest thing I enjoy about working at BP is the learning agility. The fact that you're constantly kept on your toes and you constantly have to keep yourself updated and abreast of like new technologies and new software, how to use them and how to apply them and how to support your team with them. That sort of like um it helps me because it helps me stay challenged and keeps me inspired. So I'd say off the off the top of my head, those are like the three the three most important things I I, I enjoy about working working at BP. Thanks. Thanks so much. That's great. And Natalie, what do you enjoy most about working at BP? Yeah, I think for me, it's just all about the people. And I did an internship, and that was one of the reasons I came back as a grad, because everybody I spoke to and interacted with was just absolutely fantastic and really, really willing to help and listen to questions and take the time to, you know, run you through something if you needed a bit longer. Um, so that, I think, is really the key moment. But a second thing which I think is really important as a graduate is the kind of go get it attitude that people have at BP. So if there's an opportunity or maybe a certain skill or just, you know, maybe an experience that you want, if you vocalize that with either your line manager or maybe a mentor, that that's something you would like to go and get. And um, people tend to be really accommodating with your kind of wants and desires within your career. And then you kind of have a range of huge range of opportunities available to you. You know, it could be offshore experience, it could be site experience. Interestingly, I'm not, obviously, I'm actually working on the electric vehicle charging stuff as well. So I've been doing that for most part of this year, which is something I asked for. So I think, you know, it runs true between what both of us are saying. It really is, you know, if you if you would like something, you can go and ask for it. And most of the time, people will help you get make it happen. Perfect. Thank you both. Um, and I think we've got probably time for one more question. Um, so I guess, do you have any top tips? Obviously, you both went through the application process uh, with BP. Do you have any top tips that you could pass on um, to anybody applying to BP? 
Okay, yeah, I'll go first. Um, so obviously, like the first thing I'll say is um, give yourself enough time to prepare your application so you can stand like a really good chance. You only have one one rule to apply to any particular year, and you don't want to you don't want to like do something wrong. And I'll say also learn about the company as much as possible. There are information about the company available on the company's websites, on LinkedIn, on social media channels. So you have to stay on that and know what the company is up to. Follow the news to know what's new, what projects like BP is chasing and what's, what projects um, they plan to do in the future. If you obviously like you also have to know the role you're applying to, you're applying to at BP. If you're applying to say like um, an analytical engineering role, know how that ties into BP, how your role will help like support BP's progress in general as a company. And obviously, if you if in the middle of the application process, you, you need to make an adjustment to your application or say you're ill and you can't meet up with the test deadline, you should reach out to like the early careers team and they'll be happy to support you and probably give an extension on your on your test deadline as opposed to you completely missing the deadline and not even having a chance a chance at all and of course this needs to be said you have to put together a very good cv and cover letter there are templates for this online and you can also use your um, university career services to help you double check that you have a good cv and cover letter fill out your application form correctly and um, obviously you have to know how to answer interview questions you have to know the basics of your course you have to know like where you've been taught in university, so you'll be able to answer the technical interview questions. And one last thing I'll say is from like, if you're applying like for a graduate position, you're going to do like an exploration day like um, Natalie mentioned. So you have to familiarize yourself with that and know how that works. You can do like mock mock assessment centers or like mock exploration days with your with your friends and family. So that's what I'll say. Perfect, thank you. Thanks. And Natalie, do you have any any top tips you could extend on? Yeah, I think for me, it's important to understand if BP is a good fit for you as much as you're a good fit for BP. So, you know, just like Amanat said, you can interact with BP through social media, you know, online virtual career fairs, campus teams. If there's any way for you to interact with the people that work at BP, I think this will really help you understand if it's a good fit for you. And then if you think that there is, then I would really recommend familiarizing yourself with the direction that the company's taking. So BP's new ambition and purpose, familiarize yourself with the values. And then similarly, for the technical interview, I think it's really important to think about how your degree and how your discipline relates to what the company does. So be it, you know, oil and gas engineering or electric vehicle, it's important to understand the application of the engineering, because I think that'll be really, really useful when coming to the technical interview. Wonderful. Thank you both. Great insight and uh, some great top tips there. Um, so I think we're nearly coming to time. Um, so I'm just going to leave it on, on the final slide. Um, and that is just with our, our, our opening dates. Um, so we have already opened for our traineeship in internship and graduate opportunities. We opened on the 22nd of September for those. So they are now live. Um, we are opening for everything else um, on the 6th of October. So Discovery Weeks, Insight Days, engineering science business and digital internship and graduate roles um, so our advice is always to get your application in um, as soon as you can because we do recruit on a rolling basis um, and you can just visit our website um, and it should take you to the uh, graduate candidate matching tool to make your application um, so we hope to see your application um, obviously um, and we hope that we've managed to give you some insight today into bp and a future career here so thank you for joining me. Thank you so much from the tier team at BP. That was amazing. Um, and again, any more questions, please pop them in the chat. Uh, those that registered to receive information from employers will receive further information, not just about BP, but about all of the employers here today. And we are moving over to our final uh, employer insert insights session now with WSP who joined me on stage so we're going to go straight to them but um, here's a short video first. How should our world change? We're transforming ideas into action, transforming our cities, our journeys and the environment we all share with insights into people, into places, into the fabric of our lives. With the know-how to connect communities, power dreams, shape futures, and build pride. 
Our transformative thinking sets a new agenda for a smarter, greener future that includes us all. Big change takes big ideas. We're a global family of more than 54,000 change makers, 7,000 in the UK, all with the imagination to see things, not as they are, but as they could be, as we reshape our world, one hour at a time, one project at a time. Together, we're transforming what's possible. those of you that have been with us all day, you will have seen me earlier on in one of the sessions. And for anybody that's joined since, I'm the Recruitment and Development Manager at WSP, responsible for all of our early careers programmes. I'm joined today by Chloe, Natalie and Becky, and I'll be quizzing them on their experiences of working as engineers and early career professionals within WSP. So we've talked quite a lot today about net zero and the journey to net zero and how that's important for our industry. WSP is a leader in the journey towards net zero. It's a key priority for the industry. How does your work support this journey? Chloe, I'll come to you first with that question. Yeah, sure. Um, well, really my work is all about the decarbonisation of heat. So the heat sector, uh, the buildings are responsible for around 20 to 30 percent of a carbon emission in the UK. So what I'm looking at on a day-to-day -day basis is making energy strategy and develop them from feasibility study to detailed design about how uh, we can have communal strategy between buildings to reduce that carbon emission. Um, I'm also a change maker, a net zero change maker, which means I have a, a platform where I can voice opinion about how we can change uh, things on a wider level at WSP. So for example, this Monday, we just put up a proposal to change the way we bid on project to consider better uh, the, the project we want to be the leaders in net zero and decarbonisation and have a bit of a stricter assessment regarding that, which I think is a great opportunity um, to really be that leader because we did make a commitment, uh, the WSP UK made a commitment to half the carbon emission of our design and advice by 2030, which is only around the corner really when we think about it. Great, thanks Chloe. And I think sometimes when everybody thinks about carbon emissions and net zero, they do think about wind farms and sustainable energy. So I guess your, your work is probably the first thing, even for the general public, that comes to mind when we think about net zero. And Becky, the kind of work that you do is quite mm. different and probably isn't forefront of mind when people think about net zero and how we're getting there. So I, I'll ask you the same question. How does your work contribute? Yeah, exactly. I was just thinking that. So. Um, I'm working on HS2, so High Speed 2, which is a um, significant infrastructure project being built in the UK at the moment, the biggest infrastructure project in Europe, I think, for 50 years or something. Um, and it's not what people would first think of when they think about net zero and um, um, yeah. uh, improving our impact on climate change. But um, my argument would be that by being a part of that project and because it's so significant to our government, um, they've put extremely um, large requirements on what is that for me okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> is that <laughs> even louder um sorry uh, so so our client has extremely um important restrictions on what we're allowed to do in terms of impacting the climate um and the the overall aim for hs2 is that within its life site, lifetime um it will be carbon neutral so all the carbon that goes into building it, which we're trying to minimise, um, will be offset by people using the train rather than flying. Um, and I'd also bring in the Future Ready programme, which we have at WSP, which is um, minimising our use of resources and our um, globe, um, greenhouse gas emissions, but also preparing our designs for the changes we are going to see in climate that's inevitable. Even if we stop emitting carbon now, we're going to see changes to our climate for the next 20 years. So um, all of our designs have to be forward thinking and be prepared for that change in climate. That's brilliant. Thank you. I think we might need to share this. I'm not sure. We'll try. Let's try this. So um, I think we'll probably stick on the subject of projects. Um, I, I think that's really interesting. I think it'll be interesting for everybody that's listening as well. So Natalie, I'm going to come to you next and just ask you, um, what has been the standout project so far in, in your career? Tell us a bit about it and why it stands out for you. 
So my standout project has been the redevelopment of Euston Conventional Station. Um, and as you all know, HS2 is coming, and a part of Euston will be the HS2 station. So Network Rail has commissioned to redevelop their station um, to align with HS2, and also to make sure that they can meet the capacity demands of the future. And what's been so amazing about this project is that to be able to see two huge projects coming together and integrating um, has just been a learning curve. And on top of that, I've been able to take initiative and accountability and really help develop my role on the project. Thank you. That was really interesting, and particularly that you kind of added the personal touch there about what you've been able to do and, and how you've been able to develop it. Um, Chloe, I'll, I'll come back to you. You joined WSP as a graduate. Um, so how did starting work at WSP compare to the expectations that you had before you started your career as a graduate? So yes, I did start as a, as a graduate, so it's four years uh, at WSP Solid, uh, the one and only company I've worked with except summer jobs. Um, so really, I think when starting a job from university, there is always a little moment of adaptation of bursting the university bubble and being in the workplace. Uh, and, and that's something that will happen, I think, to everyone that goes through that route. And it's good to be prepared mentally for it. But uh, what was extremely... Uh, nice about being part of a graduate scheme is that you meet all of the other graduates in other teams and you create your network already of people and friends and you can also share that experience and kind of um, have a bit of a support group like this but also have a better understanding of what WSP does in terms of all the graduates are in different teams and you know them and that came really handy when I started working on multidisciplinary project uh, to be able to know people in different team already for that uh, graduate scheme. And another thing that was really valuable to me is that actually my line manager in that, in that first team I joined uh, really took me under his wings and did a lot to train me up. And even uh, I even went on a business project in Finland with a really high profile client, I think in month four. So that was really, that was really fun uh, and, and a good opportunity to learn. The learning curve there is like this. But as long as you've got someone who's mentoring you, I think it, it goes really well and it's just the better for it. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think um, that was really interesting in terms of, as you say, responsibility and, and having opportunities. I think it's great to share with everybody that's listening today from, from wherever they are, the opportunities, especially for international work as an engineer, that's, that's certainly one of the perks of having those, those transferable skills. Um, and I'm going to stick slightly on the topic of transferable skills, um, a tenuous link, if you like. Um, Natalie, I'm going to come to you. And um, what I'd like to know is, did you always know what you wanted to do? And, and if not, how did you find your current role? So I had no idea what I wanted to do, um, but I ended up studying chemical engineering and really enjoyed engineering. And I did apply for jobs within the water industry. And funny enough, someone picked up my CV within rail and said, you know, let's interview her. And I had no idea what a systems engineer did at the time. So I studied up and I went for this interview and kind of fell into what I'm doing now. Um, they knew my skills were transferable to my current role and I love it. Instead of looking at detailed design, I look at the big picture thinking and how all these systems come together and it's really right up my alley. So I do recommend people to um, you know, go ahead and explore and really follow your interests and your passion. Thanks, Natalie. And um, Becky, I'm going to come to you next and just ask you, what do you think is the favorite thing about your role and, and also working at WSP? Um, so I think I'd have to echo what both Chloe and Natalie have sort of implied, which is just the vast scale of WSP means the variety of work you can get involved in and the scale of some of the projects we work in um, is what's really impressed me. I think a lot of my peers have done a lot of research about what size of company was right for them and things. And I think I sort of fell into WSP without really appreciating quite how global a company it is and, and how many opportunities um, came with that. Um, and I think my favorite thing about WSP is the people I work with. It's a great group of people, some of the best minds in the industry. I'm continuously learning from them um, and just feel, yeah, very fortunate to be where I am. 
That's fantastic, thank you. That time has gone so quickly. It was wonderful to hear from all of you about your projects and, and your interests and so on, but I think we're, we're out of time now. So we have um, one more video to share just to wrap up our session, but thank you all very much. Amazing. Um, that was so good. Uh, we are pretty much to the wire. I want to thank so many people for being a part of the event. Um, we, obviously, the IET for hosting us, as they do every year, and partnering with us. We share the same end goals, if you like. We're trying to get more women into STEM careers and um, it'd be amazing to be here next year saying how much more that percentage has gone up from 15. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, WSP and the employer partners that have been part of today as well. It's been brilliant hearing all of their insights and each one very, very different as well. And thank you to all of the employers that took the time out of their day to be in the chat and answer your fabulous questions that you've had throughout the event. Don't worry if you didn't manage to catch it all. Um, it's, it is a long event, but you know, every year we're trying to cram in as much content for you as possible. Everything will be available on demand afterwards. And in the um, chat now, we will just be highlighting again that registration link. If you didn't register, but you want employers to be able to contact you after the event, please, you can still register and uh, we'll pass your contact details on. Um, I'd also like to thank our STEM ambassadors that have worked in promoting this event across the universities. Um, as I said at the start, this is the most inclusive and widest reaching event that we have done to date. And actually, I've got COVID to thank for that. So um, there we go. And, you know, keep well. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for entering the competition. Oh my word, we have had so many in entries into the competition. So um, you've still got time, keep them coming in until 5.30. Um, and yep, any more questions, you can still email us questions as well. And we will do our best to pass those on to the right employers for you. Um, once those employers have connected with you after the event as well, you can ask those direct. So again, thank you. I know we are over time, but I wanted to share uh, just a little glimpse of what goes on in my crazy household. So um, I have three young girls, um, all, all under nine. And um, this is what is currently our engineering problem at the minute. So um, for those of you that live in London and are used to foxes, um, then you'll know where I'm coming from. And I know seeing this, loads of people that don't really see foxes very often will love this video. Uh, for us, it's great to see them 
but they leave an awful mess, if you know what I mean. So um, I'm going to share this with you. And um, currently, my girls are engineering solutions uh, to how they can keep the fox out of the trampoline. Uh, we, they've done their technical drawings. They are five, twin five-year-olds. Uh, they've le learnt to label their diagrams as well. We've uh, road tested two of their solutions but haven't really worked. We've discussed them and pointed out their um, pros and cons. So this is real life engineering going on in my household and there's start as early as possible and as young as possible. Um, but I thought it'd be really uh, funny to end on this to share some insights into our current life. All in VT. There we go.
So now you're here again knocking at my door A little too late for I'm sorry for The lights went out cause you kept cutting the cord And I started to fade into your grave See I finally opened up my eyes And I saw me coming back to life That I'd be better Cause the future is now